Jarvis, drop my needle. Hello, this is the hardcore legend Mick Foley, and if you are interested in listening to idiots, you came to the right place. Have a nice day. Woo! That's an attention getter. He's a very strange young man. He's an idiot. What we're dealing with here is a complete lack of respect for the law. Oh, my God, he's an idiot. You know, of course, that you're out of your jurisdiction. Personally, I think you're an idiot. But that's the evidence in the car. But I was going to Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Always like to keep my audience riveted. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, friends and fiends, and... Welcome to Free Range EDC, the podcast about everything, but mostly just the stuff we like. For the first time in what seems like a hundred years, there will only be one, one, ladies and gentlemen, Marvel movie wait, released. Wait, this, wait, wait, what? Get, 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 gotta do it like the wise man. <laughs> did you see that Friday night? <laughs> I did not. Thank you. Um, Sorry, there'll, I didn't be, mean to there'll be one Marvel movie released this year. This leaves us with uh, 33 movies currently residing within the MCU, which means that in honor of the one and only Larry Bird, we've decided to rank our top 10. And yeah, this has nothing to do with the Celtics legend, but it sounds good and we have to have some tenuous tie to reality, right? I am your Uncle Todd, and with me, as always, is the man who has prepared for this show by locking himself inside his private screening room for the last three days, watching the entirety of the MCU in preparation for this show. He has been my partner in EDC for over two decades and has a whole lot of pee bottles to empty after this recording session, I give you the man they call Tim. Greetings and salutations, my friend. At least we didn't do a top 33 in honor of uh, Larry the Legend. Well, that would, be, that's, that would be a very, very long episode. <laughs> no one's going to say that. No one's going to say that. But I do want to call attention to uh, yeah, this week on... No, not, not the pee bottles. I've, I've emptied those out and recycled them. Um... Uh, this this your past Friday on your poor your poor recycling slash garbage guy. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's yes. He's he's taking care of business. So we're, opening we're up set. that bin. <laughs> smells smells like what smells like the urine line on the L. <laughs> <laughs> the yellow line. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, no, this past Friday on SmackDown, uh, I I am digging uh, Paul Heyman as the confused uh, wise man <laughs> as as prisoner wise man. <laughs> Like I think it was Tama Tonga or or Solo just won the match and Solo turns around and looks at him and and he's holding up like you know he's holding up the 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 one finger and he's like yeah you know, he's like dude I mean <laughs> Heyman knows no bounds it is just incredible how this guy continues to entertain well the thing is like at this point his job is just <laughs> you like I think he's even said it himself like it was after he got out of like a lot of the backstage stuff that he was responsible for now it's literally just he kind of goes out he does his thing and that's it like yeah. it's yeah. it's easy and especially now he's like they put me in the hall of fame like I'm playing with so much house money right now I don't know what to do with myself <laughs> <laughs> you know he might he uh, might actually be the first person removed from the hall of fame we don't know like everything's on be. the table with Paul God well, bless him. After his Hall of Fame speech, I don't know there's much more he could say that would <laughs> That was one of the greatest promos ever. Like, all right, enough of that mushy stuff. Oh, yeah, here we go. Here we go. How are you doing, sir, on this fine evening? Ah, <sighs> doing well. Doing well. Uh I'm trying to kill grubs, uh dodging, you know, racing for the next like six or seven days of rain here in Maine because that's apparently all it's going to be. I didn't realize I'd moved to the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, we're, we're under have. a bit of a, of a downpour. Uh, not right now, but we, we had a bit of rain today, rain tomorrow, rain Wednesday. It's like wonderful. The yeah. sun shall not be seen. No. Uh, we all survived Mother's Day. Um, nice. Yeah, it's it's been a it's been a thing. So, yeah, it's uh, good times. Good times. The best of times. Yes. But All right. we should endeavor to stay somewhat on topic. Make him humble. And, and the topic up. is, I, I'm not quite sure what that has to do with our topic, but our topic is, uh, hey, we figure why not uh, go, at, go at it here and, and rank 
the top 10 MCU faves of Uncle Todd and I. So, uh, Which ought to be interesting because we way, you have to go way, way back into the Wayback Machine on this one. Episode 36, we talked about our best and worst comic book movies. Because as I had this, I had this idea, because uh, pulling back the curtain here, folks, we we were both fairly busy last week into mm-hmm. into this week and kind of realized yesterday like oh we hadn't settled on a topic to talk about what can we what can we talk about and disney's hosing us having cut back on all the content so yeah. like we, we you know we're we're struggling at times with uh, there's no new movies coming out until like july with deadpool and wolverine mm-hmm. which i mean I, i'm okay waiting for which that. i think we just need to go just just bite the bullet and go and do the uh you know the first time watch of Deadpool by the man they call Tim as as an episode. I think we oh. just need to go do it. Oh, I'm I'm. You know what? We'll do one. Do it. We'll do one and two back to back episodes. Pull the band aid. Boom. Yes, I'm all in favor. All right. Um, all right. But we we have did done a a top five of our favorite comic book movies. However, this will be exclusively MCU movies, not including streaming shows or anything. So these are mm-hmm. just the movies. I kind of almost thought we ought to include the two Deadpool movies since they it. It, it appears that now they are going to become canon. As much canon as anything Deadpool, Deadpool could possibly be. Okay. Um, but it seems like they would be. Um, but we'll see. Uh, so right. we're just dealing with the 33 movies in the MCU proper at this moment. Yes. Which, by the way, when I went and mapped out the four phases, or five phases, I should say, mm. it's kind of funny when you look at the breakdown because phase one, six films. Phase two, six films. Phase three, 11 films. Holy moly. What were they thinking? Well, you know, sometimes you just get carried away. (laughs) Apparently so. I mean, we're talking a span from 2016 to 2019. In three years, they did 11 films. That's crazy. Uh, Phase four was seven films. And then phase five, we have three so far with uh, Deadpool and Wolverine on on. uh, Well, you got to also remember, like, phase one, I mean... It takes a little while for things to catch up. Like once phase one really got going, then they realized like, oh, crap. Yeah, this is really rolling. And so then phase two, like I think they had that planned out. It took a little while for then to phase three to hit where it was pretty much like and everybody on the planet was like, you got any more of them Marvel movies? Yeah, because uh, yeah. I, I, I need a need another one of them Marvel movies pretty soon here because it's been a little while, man. I need to know. <laughs> It's it, it, but but it's interesting to see like with phase one only six films but across a four year span yeah phase two six films across a two year span <laughs> yep phase uh, three eleven films across like I said a three year I mean, I mean that that's I mean you're basically doubling the the mm-hmm. production from two to three in in the same period of time in phase four which is seven films that was in the span of a year yeah oh my gosh. Which is crazy, like starting with Black Widow in 2021 and ending with Black Panther Wakanda Forever in 2022. <sighs> so, it's insanity. Yeah. In phase five, we're, we're kind of at the, you know, two year mark here because it started last year in 2023. So, yeah, it's interesting. But we will uh, we, we will litigate. We will debate. We will uh, pontificate and uh, gestate on what our top 10 MCU movies will be. And Tim will probably flatulate, uh, I'm guessing. And we will adjudicate. You, I, you already said that. No, I did not. I said yeah. litigate. Oh, jeez. Different. <laughs> Let's just get into the week in geek. <laughs> the week uh, in geek. Woo! Feels so funky. Oh, yeah! Are you gonna are you gonna get thrown out of Paisano's uh, pizzeria as, as well before the end of the episode? Quite possibly. <laughs> That's what we're shooting for. That's what we're shooting for. Are you like Ric Flair spending $1,500 at your local pizzeria somehow? Oh, my God. On a menu where the most expensive thing is like $35? It just goes back to uh, Vince McMahon's famous comment about Bret Hart. Bret Hart screwed. Ric Flair screwed Ric Flair. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's always good when you're slurring your words uh, as you, you know, argue with the and then uh, woo in a in a grandmother's face or something. Oh my god! Talk, talk about a guy who's literally living the gimmick. My yeah. god! Oh, and he has been for a while, but now it's just it's getting really bad. Like, yeah. not only does someone need to tell Rick no more matches, like you know what, Rick, you're not allowed out in public anymore. <laughs> you need a handler. So I read an article that. 
he basically admitted that, or he ended up finding out after the fact that during that final match he had. Oh yeah, yeah. He that he had a heart a, attack. Yeah. Which we I'm just like he passed out a couple times. Yeah. But did, but didn't he say like afterwards he he was like uh yeah I had I thought it was just dehydrated so I had like two or three Gatorades and then he went out and partied all, all night. It's a miracle the man's alive. It's a miracle the man's alive. In more ways than one, he was involved in a plane crash. <laughs> oh. and, and honestly, that's probably one of the healthiest things he's done in his life. Getting in a plane crash was you know, was a, compared to some of the other things he's done to himself, yeah, it's not that bad. All right, well, our first item, uh, moving on from Ric Flair, uh, is a quick jump back to... Can you uh, ever really move on from Ric Flair? I think so. Mm. Okay, we'll try. I mean, he is Space Mountain, but... uh... (laughs) (laughs) Yes! All right, folks. uh, Looking back at last episode, I had it in another thing, uh, which was a rigorous supportive go get them for a show on apple tv called constellation and three days later three days later what do i see in in my my feed of news articles apple tv has canceled constellation after one season or as the undertaker would say (laughs) (laughs) old school that's what he would say rest in (laughs) peace yeah, all 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 that you are to the say, harbinger of death. You are I, the destroyer of worlds. I am, and and God help my next and another thing at the end of this episode. Forget Kara Thrace. It's you. It's it always is. been you, Tim. I am. I am. So uh, first it was Google Podcast. Now it is a uh, see a, a series on Apple TV uh, that I just wrapped up. You know, now that uh, I now that I think about it, yes, service merchandise is on your resume too, and they went out of business. Yes. We need to trace this back further, sir. All right. I'm just saying it seems like there's a pattern. When when I'm out there in Chicago, we're gonna get we're gonna get the big board, we're gonna have the red string going everywhere. It's gonna be great. Well, I I mean, to be honest, there there was a period of time in the two thousands where uh myself and, and a colleague who I've I've I'm working, you know, we work together at the same company now, but um we went on this run where it seemed like every like like we work for a sequence of startups. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like every startup we went to, we couldn't last more than three years, two and a half, three years before it failed. You shouldn't be allowed to work together. <laughs> <laughs> like that's that's a th- that should be a thing. <laughs> like in good conscience, you, you should be checking with each other. Like, where are you applying next? All right, I'm going to go here. Never once did I think I was the reason for for the the short lifespan, but nonetheless. Uh... But you we're not saying that you aren't. I mean, you're much like you're like the cook on the Titanic who rode the <laughs> ship all the way down. <laughs> and just stepped off at the very end. Like, Let me see. Where am I going to go next? Woohoo! Ride him, daddy. <laughs> where can I swim to next? Oh, God. All right. Well, nonetheless, uh, if, if you are looking to, uh, y- you know, spend a little bit of time watching a show, you might want to find something other than Constellation because you're going to get one season. It ends on a cliffhanger and you're kind of <laughs> like, yeah, I know it was. It's just it sucks. Awful. Just awful. All right. Anyways. Uh, so our first uh, Week in Geek article, uh, courtesy of our friends at Collider.com. Now, this is. Happened to come out the morning after we recorded our last episode. 5.15 in the morning as I sit down to read my morning news, if you will. And this article pops up on my feed. While sitting on the toilet. No, I was in our <laughs> living room having a cup of coffee and relaxing. Ah. Uh, it's time to go down the rabbit hole and accept the Matrix Resurrection is great. And so uh, after our article that we based an entire episode on that was talking about how it wasn't great. The perfect rebuttal was there if we just waited one more one day. One more day. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we're uh, ahead of our time. And most of the time it doesn't work to our advantage. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Uh, but basically goes into, uh, you know, dives into a little bit. Um, w- really, the reason behind what makes it great is. What, what it argues is around Neo and the character of Neo basically, you know, in, in a lot of ways, like we and we talked about this last episode, how um, 
it was in, in, in a way kind of a slight retelling of the first movie where you had him, you know, in, in a state where he's remembering things and trying to break out of whatever he's, you know, trapped by. Mm -hmm. But what the article talks about is just how, um, how this, this helps, uh, you know, kind of round him out as, as a much more flushed out character and, and has him kind of deal with the weight of the responsibility of the sacrifice he made, not necessarily leading to the end that, uh, that, that was originally intended. And, 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 and these are some things that we talked about last time. So not looking to re re relitigate it all over again, but it was just kind of interesting how it was touching on some of the arguments you and I, I, I mean, you, you were, you were more in, in, in the negative camp on it, understandably so. And I was in more of the positive camp. Um, so I, I found this article interesting because it did echo, uh, some of the points, you know, that, that we were talking through and making, hmm. um, you know, it talks about, uh, you know, the article that we were talking about last week, um, you know, mentioned how the, the, the movie was too meta for its own good. This one talks about how the meta approach worked for it. Um, and, and that it was, um, you know, the fact that it was in, in a lot of ways kind of not taking itself too seriously and, and in some ways, um, you know, making fun of, you know, sort of the past, uh, you know, ep not episodes, but past movies and, mm. and some of the themes in them um, was, you know, was was something that helped elevate the story a bit. And, and again, um, you know, basically get into let me see, uh, what was the line I was looking for? Um, yeah, I already talked about the recognize with with the victory comes a burden of responsibility. So so it's 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 humanizing Neo a bit more. Um, it uh, it argues that this is the most sincere movie in the series, which I I know Uncle Todd may have an issue with um, the Whoa. argument. The 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 argument there, you know, we talk about how it's a love story. Yeah, um, the first you know, one was as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but you know, it talks about how by the end of the movie, you know, that, that Neo realizes that it's his love for Trinity that gives him his power that united. And, and we talked about this, that united, they are more powerful than when they are separated. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so it was just, it's, it's a short article, but it was just kind of talking about how, um, while a lot of folks, as we discussed, well, a lot of fans did not like it, it was an outing that, um, you know, for, for some who look at it in a more positive way was, was kind of a nice way to, uh, close out, you know, the story of, of, you know, these two characters and, and of that franchise or not franchise, but of that arc, mm -hmm. um, it leaves it somewhat, you know, it leaves it somewhat ambiguous because we, you know, we, we get the sense that he and Trinity are going to remake the matrix, but we have no idea what that means. We have no idea how that impacts the people in the matrix. And now with this new movie coming out, like where, where does it all go from there? So, yeah. uh, so anyway, so just, just a little bit on, on that. So, and any thoughts on that, sir? Ooh. That didn't sound good. Yeah, that was interesting. Got a little frog trying to come out. Um, I mean, I, I get it and I, I get those points. And to me, to me, it, it, in a way, it almost sounds a little bit like my defense of, uh, recluse Luke from the last jedi and how that makes sense for that character you know uh, yep. whereas a lot of hardcore fans were not they wanted their same luke skywalker they grew up with um i'm not I, I guess my thing is like my dislike of the matrix sequels is that i don't i just i just i feel like it, it probably would have wound up great as a standalone film just mm -hmm. the first one if you're looking for a way to close out the story, I think four did a fairly good job of doing it. Like mm -hmm. I actually think that four kind of brought it home in this in this direction that that appealed to me. Now, granted, maybe I'm of just that certain age that the Matrix hit me at a certain point in my life, and then now that I'm older, this one hits me in the same spot as as it would be different for someone who watched the Matrix like two years ago. Mm -hmm. And then powered through all the movies and then got to the fourth one like, eh, yeah, it wouldn't be the same. My con my problem is like now, oh, great, we're going to get more of these and they're going to get less and less and less, you know, sincere mm -hmm. and true to the material because now it's really about cash. It's an imperfect movie. 
Four is yeah. an imperfect movie because, like I said about the other one, like Godfather Three, the whole I, well, someone they're going to do it anyway, so I might as well do it. It just never works out because it's yeah. not going to work out even if the studio does it with someone else. Like it's just this is not going to go well, yeah, in some way, shape, or form. Um, so it's interesting. No, I and I really wish that we had. <laughs> I really wish that we had delayed our recording by 24 hours because that would have been an interesting thing to talk about. Uh, two, two other points, because, of course, I cannot speak and read quickly at the same time. Um, it argues the greatest success of uh, the movie is its justification of Neo's return. Um, there was no need to bring back Reese in the role if it was only evoking nostalgia, but Resurrection succeeds in bringing back Neo to the vulnerable place he was at the beginning of the first film. We talked about that. Upon realizing that mankind is once again at war with the machines, Neo is left to question whether his initial sacrifice had any lasting ramifications. And it was Reeves was able to show a more grizzled, vulnerable side to the character as he became trapped within the mundanity of the simulation, Hmm. which I thought I I thought that was kind of an interesting point, you know, that, um, you know, along with, you know, the weight of the responsibility of of being that, you know, the one and, and the sacrifice. But the fact that he comes back and realizes that that sacrifice didn't have the lasting effect that he thought it did have an effect. You mm-hmm. know, it, it, it did show that the machines were not singularly against humanity, that there was a split and there were machines that were supporting humans as opposed to um, only trying to subjugate them. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I, I agree with that. I, I, I like it. Um, you know, it, it had very positive things to say about Neil Patrick Harris, uh, you know, disguising himself as Neo's therapist, but being this, you know, the, the analyst who essentially kind of took over from the architect. Mm. Um, it praised Jonathan Groff's, um, uh, uses a phrase that Uncle Todd uses sometimes, scenery chewing performance as the new version of Smith. Do you, do you object to that description? I don't know. It's honestly, it's you look perplexed because I've, I've literally, it's been so long. I only watched matrix four once. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't, Hard it doesn't judge. stand out to me. Yeah. I can say that. So maybe it's not quite as, I wouldn't have agreed with it a hundred percent. Oh. And it also brought up an interesting point too, that, you know, revolutions kind of ended on a down note, even though, you know, it, he achieved victory. It was, mm. you know, at the cost of his, of both him and Trinity's, you know, life. And so there was just that kind of, you know, a bit of a cloud hanging over it, even though at the end we start to see this new vibrant matrix once it's rebooted. Yeah. Um, and the presumption there is that now there is a brighter future for humanity and the machines. Um, and so I, I, I like the fact that it, it, you know, kind of called out that, you know, in a lot of ways this is, um, you know, you know, kind of bringing a happy ending to, to this that that maybe was lacking last time, you know, where it's he and Trinity kind of ruling now as as this dual, um, you know, the one sort sort of. Uh, yeah, except entity. it's not the end. That's right. It's not the end. And is it really the one if it's the two? They're the Sith. <gasps> All right. Moving on from that, I think we've we had dyad. Yeah, the oh my god, the dyad. Yeah, the dyad. Um, from ScreenRant.com, purveyors of all that are good and pure in this world. Uh, Battlestar Galactica theory uh, explains. Is that how, their new cat? Is that like their subhead on, like that? Their slogan. No, that's 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 a subhead I give them. So oh, I thought so. That's in the in in the little the little info they give you to as, no. as you pimp them shamelessly on our show. This 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 is the man they called him editorializing. So uh, I see. But interesting article, Battlestar Galactica Theory explains how the 2004 reboot reboot is actually a prequel to the 1978 show. Uh, the article talks about how... What? Uh, that's what it says. Did you not read it? Do you not pre-read these articles that no! are meticulously co- you know, curate? How long have we been doing this show? Hold you you don't know it. this yet? I don't read any of this. I take this portion of the show off. I just re- I'm just a reaction monkey right now. That's oh all I do. Great. Great. Uh, well, yeah, as we know, copying and pasting them in there, anyways. Well, <laughs> uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, but as we know, the the 2004 reboot was a serious departure from the 78 uh, 1978 series. Uh, there's a compelling theory that argues the two shows might actually share a universe and both versions. It really comes. If if I were to summarize it, it really uh, the article hones in on the the cycle of of life. That, that this has all happened before and it will yeah. happen again. Mm-hmm. And the idea being that the, um, 
you know, the two shows share a lot of elements, including distinct characters and settings. I think what this article is kind of arguing in terms of this theory is that there's this constant cycle of humanity versus their creation. Um, and, and even going so far as to say that there are just, you know, characters like Starbuck and Adama and others who who will always crop up in this cycle, that there always will be a mm-hmm. Starbuck and they will always serve a particular purpose. There will always be an Apollo who will always yeah. serve a particular purpose. And so I thought it was kind of interesting. I, I don't buy into it myself. I, I kind of like to think of the 04 reboot as being its own universe, its own thing. Yeah. Um, and if if this this Sam Esmail series that we've been talking about for the last four years actually comes to, or five years actually comes to fruition, uh, it'll be interesting to see if they, you know, try to link themselves to the reboot universe. Um, I don't know that anyone really cares about the 78 series and whether it, it's tied into it or not, to be honest, you know? Well, two things on this. Uh, first, yes. interesting tie-in from this to my and another thing, which we will get to later Ooh. on. See, we planned that, folks. <laughs> <laughs> you wish we planned this. We're not, we're not, that, we're not that put together. Um the second is if they it would be kind of interesting if they had shown any of the in the in the finale of the 2004 show um if they had shown any of them in Egypt because there was a lot of Egyptian iconography ah, in yeah. the 78 battle star that would have been kind of interesting although you would mm-hmm. think that like okay well they kind of spread out around the world and something you know maybe you know uh, Ishi or you know who pick whoever you want. Doc Cottle wound up in the in you know Egypt or something. Yeah, um, that would be kind of interesting. Um, it, I guess. I mean, yeah. When you're when you're into like that whole yeah, it's all happened before. It's all going to happen again. Well, yeah. It, 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 take your pick. Like the seventy eight could have been the prequel to this one because hey, it's it's always the and then the twelve. I mean, yeah, it could be anything. So interesting but uh, thin yeah wicked thin wicked yeah. thin not wafer thin not wake wafer thin wicked thin wicked thin. wicked right. silly silly me all right well uh, i think uh we here at free range idiocy uh resoundingly reject said theory and uh we'll we'll continue forward with the 04 reboot being the prime universe yes Last one, which is kind of interesting, once again, from our friends at Collider.com, all things uh, good in sci-fi. Uh, that was my editorializing right there. Uh, back to the future. You're futures. getting paid on the sly for these. Feed Maybe. you links. <laughs> Maybe. Back to the Futures original ending was way, way darker. Uh, and oh this was kind of interesting. Um, basically... Uh, uh, Robert Zemeckis and co-writer Bob Gale were talking about um, ideas that they had had uh, originally for um, the ending of, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the, the movie in terms of how Marty gets back to his time. Mm. And this one was interesting because apparently um, it ended up having to do with uh, Marty driving the DeLorean, I kid you not, through a nuclear explosion. I thought I read about this somewhere. Yes. Yeah. That uh, basically, um, even though the movie ended up resolving, and and really what what, what I kind of file this one under is, it's very interesting to read, not just for the content of what could have been the ending, but to realize how serendipitous it is that some of these movies end up the way that they do. I mean, Back to Mm -hmm. the Future is probably as close to a perfect movie as you're going to get from a storytelling perspective from a time, you know, for a time travel story, it was very, Oh yeah. um, It hits all the notes, hits all the notes, has such, you know, great heart to it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, stands the test of time. I've watched it with my kids. We it's, it's a movie they, they absolutely enjoy. Even though we're living in the future. Absolutely. Of back to the future. Um, but, uh, and, and so it's very interesting to, to read about how they originally, um, you know, as we all know, Marty gets back because he and Doc, you know, are able to coordinate a lightning strike because they know when it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But if you remember, um, you know, the, the, the main way the car is able to time travel is through basically radiation uh, or, or uh, 
what the heck was it? Well, it's, it's uh, plutonium. It's, yeah, plutonium. Well, it's, but it's nuclear power generation, so it is still measured right. in electricity. Right. right. But yeah. And so the idea would be that um, they would, basically in the storyboards, uh, the military is preparing for a bomb test in the desert, and several men are standing in the bomb test tower, and they look out to see a DeLorean racing toward them. Doc Brown, who's on a radio, has timed it out just right for Marty to race into the test site as the bomb is going off. And there are, are some similarities to the film ending with Dark Brown, Doc Brown finding the letter warning of his death in 1985, which that was also supposedly different because he tears up the letter and throws it in the car, mm. not put it into, into his jacket pocket. That was another change they made to the story to make it where he ends up pasting it back together and realizing what happens and prepares mm-hmm. for it. And so it was just interesting to read how, you, you know, two things that you don't really you know, like, like I said, when, when I go back and watch that movie, I think like that sequence when he goes back to 1985 could not have been more perfectly done. I mean, the, the, mm. the cuts, the, the shot cuts between Doc climbing the tower to get things, you know, put back together versus Marty trying to get the car up to 88 miles an hour were it's just some of the best cinematography I, I've, I've, I think I've oh, ever and, seen. It was the tension was incredible. Oh, yeah. And even when they get back. Yeah. Like he, he gets back to the future. Mm-hmm. And then that then that there's continued tension because then now he's going to try and save Doc. He's going to try to say, yeah. And yes. so it's like just when you think that there might be a bit of relief, there isn't. Right. Right. You know. Yeah. Oh no. It's and yeah. and then yeah. That it is. It is a it is a fantastic movie, and I'm so glad that I I think it's Zemeckis mm-hmm. and maybe two other people have absolute control over it, and they yeah. actually have it written into their wills that mm-hmm. no one will sell the rights to make remakes, more sequels, or anything. Yep. So it's like those three Back to the Future movies, that's it. These guys yep. have it in their wills. I'm like, you know what? I admire that so much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you for not ruining my childhood. Absolutely. Absolutely. So just a little of uh, minutia there on Back to the Future and what could have been. Indeed. And that, my friends, is a neat and tidy Week in Geek. Yeah. Neat and tidy. About thirty minutes. Tim before we're like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna sail right through these. Is it forty is forty five less than thirty three? I do not think so. Thirty three is less than forty five, and we normally go about forty forty five. So I see have... now you're just fooling me with your mathematical skills, sir. Don't try and dazzle me. Don't try and dazzle me with your math. All the maths, baby. <laughs> All the maths, right you here. And, you and your numbers. They don't lie. The numbers don't lie. <laughs> I would beg to differ. And speaking of numbers. Yes. The top 10. Ah, uh, yes. But first, we have some we have some honorable mentions. So here, we're dealing with uh, the 33 movies of uh, the first, well, four and what, like half of Phase 5? I mean, who knows how many movies are going to be in Phase I, 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 so, don't know if, I don't know if Feige knows how many are going to be in Phase no, 5. No, so so the point. Wikipedia article I, I linked, which will be in the show notes, does have the slate for five, but I didn't list them because basically those movies haven't come out yet. So well, yeah. there's no, no sense in listing them. So. I just mean that they've been shifting things so much yep. over the last few years that, you know, right. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect them... I wouldn't be surprised if after, like, if Deadpool and Wolverine went well... That they're like, all right, phase five's done. <laughs> We're now in a six. We're going to reshuffle everything. Um, Forget five ever happened. <laughs> just go out on a good note. Um, so yeah, this will this will be very interesting because uh, we have made one executive decision, which I believe we agreed on. This we have two rules in Fight Club. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, so we have our two honorable mentions. We have top ten picks out of the thirty three, and we are treating Endgame and Infinity War as one Uba movie. It just makes sense. It gives it us a little bit, sense. a little bit more to play with. Um, all right, do you want to go with your honorable mentions first, sir? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, and so, uh, after much uh, thought, and by that I mean the ten or fifteen. No, I'm kidding. I, I I put some thought into this. I put some thought into it. this. Was hard because I I had to remember. I haven't seen some of these movies in a while, and I'm trying to mm-hmm. re- like I, I'm weighing impact because I'm trying to think about. I kind of went with rewatchability. Like, how many of these movies have I watched over and over and over again? That's yeah. That's that's one dimension to certainly look at it. The other is, um, and 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 we'll get into this with with. I love how you do that. That's one way to think about it. But the correct way. No, 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 no. It's one way to think about it. But what I noticed when I was going through them last night is, Mm -hmm. 
there are um there there are several movies that landed in the top 10 that I put there because of strength of story. Like like the stories of some of these movies were so mm-hmm. well done for a comic book movie. Like you oh, know yeah. the, the 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 human condition, the the way they they and a lot of them are origin stories, but the way they were able to make them grounded and human and connected or or connectable, you know, as, as a as an audience member, um, is what really stuck with me. And how some of these movies had very relevant themes to our times, um, you know, specifically when you think of some of the Captain America movies, because those are the ones I think they did a very good job of of really kind of bringing into or bringing to bear the 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 cost of technology in in society and what that can do Mm -hmm. and so um so with all that being said my honorable mentions uh and and i'm starting with the the you know basically if you think of this as number 12 and number 11 uh i'm gonna go with shang chi and the legend of the ten rings Mm, good call yeah i could not let this one not be in my list because shang chi was one that i thought was going to end up not connecting with with the the marvel audience i thought it was going you know much like guardians of the galaxy i I was expecting because i didn't know it really well really well and i didn't know the story that it wasn't going to connect well it was going to be a crap movie and it turned out to be a really well done movie um, with a really good story to it um just not I, top 10 has some freaking strong movies, my friend, strong movies. So it just, yeah. it, it had packed a punch, but not enough to break into the 10. Um, but I had to go with Shang-Chi and the legend of the 10 rings. That was a, that was a tough exclusion for me. That one didn't make my list. Um, and it was a it, it, like, I was, that was the last one I was debating on and yeah. I, I, I couldn't do it. Yeah. Couldn't do it. Yeah. Do you want me to go with my number 11, or do you want to do your number 12? Uh, I'll do my number 12. Uh, so my number 12 is Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Um, really? I have I just really wow. thought this was a great flick. Um, I love the intro of the Winter Soldier character. I thought Sebastian Stan did a great job. Um, I loved how it's it's the it's the continuation of, of Steve Rogers coming to terms with being the man out of time. Um, I also really liked the fact that they used the black widow character to develop a little bit more humanity to Mm -hmm. Steve, even though you think, I mean, even though Steve is captain America, the super soldier, like the super soldier. Mm -hmm. And he is, he's like human personified. Like he is that vulnerable character, but he's also this, the other thing. And it kind of gave you a little bit more insight into just who he is while also giving you a lot more interest, uh, a lot more insight into who uh, Natasha was Mm. as a character. Um, And I thought their chemistry was really good uh, in the, in the flick. Um, Robert Redford, you know, such a great performance. (laughs) as as just kind of the you know a douche. Um well, and, and don't forget that the the technology part of it too. The fact that yes. they were developing basically something that would predict who would be I don't know, subjugated versus who would rise up against and and how yeah. this was something that was was, you know, 20, 30, 40 years in the making, you know, mm-hmm. sort of thing. And I, I thought that was a really cool, you know, aspect as well. Well, it goes into your, you know, minority report sort of territory where it's it's predictive, you know, AI. Yeah. Like, oh, these are the people who are going to be a problem, so let's go out and take care of them now. Like, yep. okay, just, you know, you're out there gardening, zap, zap. You know, there's a grease stain where you <gasps> used to be. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah no, it, it, it raises a lot of interesting questions. And it, was, and it was a solid action flick all the way through. It kind of surprised it's an honorable mention for you. That's not in the top ten. I know that, but dude. There's a lot of heavy hitters in here. A lot of heavy. hitters. All right, we'll have to sort through this. I'm I'm very curious to hear who who made it into your your prize ten. What's your uh, What's your number one honorable mention? Uh, number one honorable mention uh, is uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. Uh, I went with volume hmm. three because um, when I thought about the three movies, uh, one uh, it holds a very special place in my heart because it was that first movie that I thought, oh, this is going to be crap. Because, again, I didn't understand it. I don't read the comics. I don't know anything about it. So, mm-hmm. oh, it's going to be garbage. <laughs> and it turned out to 
really impressed me and surprised me with how good it was yeah. and, and just how they establish, you know, the four of them, um, you know, Dave Batista as Drax, which I was expecting that to be a total joke. He was amazing. As oh Drax. yeah. No, he's, he is Drax. You know, I mean, a it's a great character, but Holy at the same time, like then you listen to Dave Batista talk like Dave Batista, yeah. the person, not the wrestler, not the, not the character or whatever. And you're like, Oh my gosh, this dude is incredibly, he really seems like he's a thoughtful dude. Yeah. Like he's uh-huh. not he's not a complete meathead. Like no. Oh, didn't nope. wasn't expecting that one. No, no. Especially but if you listen to with, Uncle Corny's podcast talking about him. Um you wouldn't get that impression. But. No, no. With uh with volume three though, we had um a really interesting story with with you know with Ro- is it uh, with Rocket the Raccoon mm-hmm. and his uh <laughs> I thought she was gonna get you. <laughs> I expect more out of you. <laughs> no, no. Nana. <Na-na. laughs> she was coming in ninja style. I wanted to see if that was going to work or not. To bed. Like, shouldn't you be? T- yeah, I think you do. Are we, are we getting jokes? No, you're not going to be greasy. That's my job. Are we, are we doing jokes? Okay, hang on a second. There's a Kalen's Comedy Corner. This is Kalen's Comedy Corner. All right. What's. Wait, you got to stretch? We gotta st- <laughs> we're, into, we're into the she Tom Brady. Her old man pulls nope. a hammy doing some comedy. <laughs> well, pliability or something. All right, are we ready? First, I'll laugh before you even oh, say anything. Mic out of my hand now. Oh, look at this. Holding on to it because I don't want you to stick it on my face. No, here, no, here. no, I'm good. I'll just stick like this. You've never heard a funny Star Wars joke. You must be looking in all the wrong places. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not get that? No, I don't. Oh. Okay. Now he gets it. I'm a little slow. You really have to you have to kind of lean into the pronunciation. But anyways, all right. So do you have another one? Uh, what do you call a droid that takes a shortcut? A droid that takes a shortcut. Um, I'm going to kick myself for not knowing this. Me too. R2 detour. Dang, blam it! <laughs> How do I not guess these? You got Tim on that one. I have one, except it's not exactly a Star Wars joke. It's just something okay. that I found, and it's just that I'm socially vegan because I don't like meat in people. <laughs> you know, she always Same. ends strong. She always ends strong. Well done, yes. Kalen. Very nicely done. The comedy corner has come to an end. All right. You're taking a shower. Wah, 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 wah. All right. Good night. Love you. I so was hoping she was going to like get the jump on you, man. Well, I saw a little like a shadow over here. My cat like reflexes came out. All right. So, wait a minute. Did we? Did you get into your number 11? I did not. I, I was start. Oh, I, I did. I was talking about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume. Oh, yes. Yeah, so. Right. I was talking about, uh, you know, this was the one that focused on on Rocket's uh, backstory, and uh, and and I I really liked it. It was also, you know, we we knew this was going to be the last one with the original Guardians, and so I, I thought they did a nice job of, you know, kind of giving them a strong send off, um, with it being, you know, very much about, you know, kind of the band breaking up and. Um, but but it also resolving, you know, some some stories with each of these characters, you know, Drax becoming kind of a father to to many, you know, you know kids um, that, that they had freed. Um, and, and, you know, basically that, you know, in some ways, kind of a biblical thing where, where each of them are getting a bit more than what they 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 lost, you know what I mean? And so um, so I thought it was really cool the way they did that. Um, you know, it was great to see. Um, Star Lord, you know, kind of reconnect with his original family on Earth, um, and and that sort of thing. And so, no, I, I just thought it was a very heartwarming tale. Um, it was a great, you know, it was a strong way to close out. And then, you know, it closes out with the Guardians as the as as a group, the Guardians of the Galaxy, not necessarily going away because the originals split off, 
Mm. But now there's a whole new set of Guardians of the Galaxy that are uh, out there and stuff. And so I thought it was just it was just a well done done movie, and I I really uh, really enjoyed it. So that will be my number eleven. Hmm. Very good choice. Not I. Well, I, maybe I need to rewatch Volume Three. I. I thought Volume Three was better than Volume Two. I, I Volume mm. Two was okay. I mean, it had a good father son sort of thing going on, but I don't know for some reason three really resonated with me more. I don't know if it's just they, you know, it, it was it was the the ending of of the group or or what it was, but it was uh, it just I don't know stuck with me more. Probably just had a really good steak that night. I you know I did. <laughs> I did beforehand. It was really good. And I had some deviled eggs before then, too. Oh, I'm so. sure you did. I'm, I, at some point, you're going to have to figure out a way to have, like, the deviled eggs, like, stuffed into. Like, you're going to butterfly a steak and then stuff some, like, deep-fried deviled eggs into the steak and then have it tied together. When you come out, we have got to somehow get to Adele's so you can try those deviled eggs, man. So, they are amazing. So for those of you listening, there is a there is a plan in place for me to go and visit Chicago and and hang out in person with the man they call Tim. It is one of the signs of the apocalypse that that the idiots get together in Chicago. So I just want to make that and clear. so far the entire trip is just revolving around food. It is, it, it well, is food and logistics. I, I'm all about the logistics here. I got to have everything mapped logistics out. Logistics revolve I'm, around getting to the food. Well, <laughs> fair enough. Fair <laughs> Hey, got to know how you're going to, you know, sustain oneself when you're, you know, marching around the downtown area of Chicago. And so far, I think we're up to like six meals a day. Like, I don't know how I'm going to, like, my wife is concerned. She's like, you're not going to drink too much. I'm like, I don't know if the drinking is what I'm going to have to worry about. I might be just like overdosed on meat. I may come back and you may need to shock my heart back into a normal pace. (laughs) I might need two seats on my flight home. That's what I'm going to (laughs) need. You're like three axe handles wide. <laughs> now Jeez. I know. Now I know why you want to fly Frontier. You want to pay for that extra seat. <laughs> That's about the only way I'm going to do it. It's I might preparation. Have to, I might have, to, might have to ship myself home freight. <laughs> it's a giant crate with some holes drilled in it. <laughs> I'm hearing noises coming from this thing. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Oh, it's the sound of the meat sweats. I think I smell some devil eggs. <laughs> Anyways, all right. Oh, uh, my my number eleven. My first uh, honorable mention or number eleven uh, is the Doctor Strange. Uh, Doctor Strange ah. one, which I I just I just really enjoyed this movie. Like, there's it's not a perfect movie. There's definitely things about it, but I mean, I just enjoyed the Stephen Strange origin story. Even though, I mean, there is a case to be made that he's kind of discount Tony Stark uh, for sure. Yeah. But Benedict Cumberbatch, man. Uh, he does he just chews scenery and he does really well with this role what could be kind of a one note sort of uh you know two-dimensional role like he actually fleshes it out pretty well um you know and of course we get the introduction of of wong uh you know with uh, mm. with you know uh, uh, benedict wong uh, we get two benedicts in this movie which is i mean that's <laughs> what else can you ask for uh, Chi Wattel was great in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll just, you know, Mads Mikkelsen, of course, fracking awesome. Uh, we'll pass on talking too, too much about the whitewashing of the ancient one uh, with Tilda Swinton. I think it worked, but it's also still a little bit of that old Hollywood mentality, the sliding in and not in an ironic way, just in a way, hey, this is just what we do. Um, but no, I, I really enjoyed this movie, and it's, it, this is one that for me kind of came down to like, yeah, I've watched, I've rewatched this movie so many times mm-hmm. that to me, it's like, even if it's not the best movie, it's so enjoyable for me. So mm-hmm. it's definitely an honorable mention. Nice. nice. All right, so number ten in your in your top ten proper, sir. What do you got? All right, number ten. Are you ready? Drum roll. Uh, number ten is Spider Man Homecoming. Oh. Oh, okay. Had to include. Uh, I I really feel like out of the three Spider-Man films that were made, um, Homecoming was one of the strong ones. Um, I will, I'll get mm. into what the other one is after. Um, but Homecoming for me was a great, um, you know, kind of going back to that origin story of Peter Parker becoming Spider-Man, and, uh, and well, an and, origin story without the origin story. Yeah, yeah. Like it was, it was really it focused a lot on that in between that you don't normally get in the, in the origin story. Like you get the, Oh, this thing happened to me. And then there's usually like, and then I got better. And then here's the big thing. Like this was like, Mm -hmm. I'm getting better. (laughs) 
Yeah. Like, we all yeah. know what happened, all right? We don't need to kill Uncle Ben again, you know? Right, right. Um, yeah, no, it, good pick. Yep, yep. So I'm going with that uh, based on just quality and, uh, you know, again, story and, uh, you know, quality of story, strength of story, and impact. So mm-hmm. number 10, Spider-Man Homecoming. What's your number 10, sir? Uh, I'm going in Spider-Man as well. Uh, Spider-Man No Way Home. Ah, interesting. Which, uh, you know, multiple Spider-Men, you know, it was a, it's a, it's a big flick. Um, gosh, I mean, we get, uh, we get Willem Dafoe and all of his just <laughs> glorious off-putting weirdness. Um, and you know, you kind of get, there's like real stakes in here. Like, my gosh, they killed Aunt May. I mean, holy crap. Yeah. You know? And it really throws things sideways. Like the end of this movie is a it's it's the it's the up of victory and then the down of like but what what had to be sacrificed. Right. Um the up which of is, victory and the down of exile is basically Yeah, which is why, you know, in a way, like as much as I did not like this you know, Matrix two and three, three I, you know, okay, fine. If that's the way you're going to close it out, that's an interesting way to close it out in a, in mm-hmm. a, in a series of movies that have always been about the unexpected and, and amb- ambiguity and kind of turning things on their head. The heroes die. Yeah. Okay. They're like the ultimate sacrifice and then things go on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I kind of respect them pulling that out you know here in no way home that it's like yeah he makes this sacrifice and and has to live with it like wow okay um yeah it, overall just a, a super strong movie super strong movie i think nice nice what do you got for good, number good, nine? good selection sir good selection. Yeah, thank you uh my number nine mm. is going to be guardians of the galaxy volume one uh the one that started it all the one that uh Introduced us to uh, Ronan the Accuser, uh, the one that expanded a bit upon the Thanos character. This was one of the more, uh, I mean, it wasn't a long scene, but we got a little bit more, you know, speaking parts from Josh Brolin. Um, yep. Up to that point, I think Thanos was mostly relegated to end credit scenes. And so. And wasn't, um, um, was this the first vocal appearance of Josh Brolin? Because I think that they had him vote. I think that Thanos yes. was actually voiced by someone different in some of the post credit scenes. Uh possibly, yeah. But I I mean definitely Josh Brolin was voicing him yeah. in this movie. I don't remember who was voicing him before or if there were a lot of spoken parts before. Or not. Well, in the first post credit scene, he didn't say nothing. No, he he just looked at the camera and smiled or something yeah. goofy like that. And then there was the scene where he actually took out the infinity gauntlet and he's like, "I'll do it myself." Yeah. And I want I want to say that wasn't Brolin. But hmm. I might be wrong. Um Maybe he just didn't have the character fully baked at that point. Yeah, but no, oh, oh, such a, such a great like putting the band together movie. Well, and it's got oh. a sacrifice. You have Groot sacrifice in it. You have yep. them, you know, really like, like the scene where they're all kind of linking together as he's holding the power stone mm-hmm. was was just a phenomenal, you know, scene. You know, yeah. kind of establishing them as you know, kind of the guardians of the galaxy, mm-hmm. and uh, and you know, just and and the way they wove in like music from you know, our time or or before our time uh, was just phenomenal. You know, I mean, I just, uh, that's the one thing I've loved about Guardians is, is the way they, you know, their soundtrack is so much based in, you know, Motown and, you know, I love the the fact they worked in the, they worked in that tune by Redbone. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Native American like band. I was like, cause I, you forget how like just kick ass that song is. Yeah. That is a kick ass song. (laughs) Yeah. hundred percent. If you're going to have one hit, it's hell of a hit. It is. So, yep, my number nine, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 1. The dance-off to save the galaxy. That's right. That and I love, I just, I love that there are moments of being so. Things are going to get better. Oh, my gosh, yes. I I, I love the part where he's like, now wait for this right here. (laughs) Yes. Someday. (laughs) That that was, that that is like peak Chris, Chris Pratt. Like, that and like Parks and Rec. Well, and it's not just that, it's, it's. I forget the actor's name, but the guy playing Ronan the yes. Accuser is just like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's just like, he's flummoxed by this. 
Well, I'm it, only holding a sledgehammer here of doom, but I'm it, just like, what is happening before my eyes? It's the Aquafina thing in Shang Chi of like just yelling out of screaming Hotel California. Yes, yes. You know, disorientation. 100%. 100%. Um, What's your right. number nine? Number nine, Iron Man 2. Oh. I, now, I, interesting thing for me, Yes. Iron Man 2 is not in my top 10. Ooh. It wasn't even in my top 20. It, to me, is the one of the weaker outings for Iron oh, Man. Oh, dude. So, Oh, so I have thoughts. I love this flick. Um, mm-hmm. I think they did... They did a dis. If if anything, the shine is off of this movie. If only because I feel like they wasted two really good bad guys that they never brought back. There's a bit of Darth Maul jobbing going on here, not as egregious as Darth Maul. Mm-hmm. They gave Sam Rockwell and Mickey Rourke a lot more than like three lines mm-hmm. and a minute and a half of screen time. However, Whiplash and uh, Justin Hammer should have been in other movies, mm. um, especially Justin Hammer. Like, dear God, like that. His character was just so swarmy and slimy and just fantastic. Just the guy that you're instantly like, I don't like this douchebag, but yet he's entertaining to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, I just like this flick because it was really the struggle of Tony Stark. Yeah. You know, and and. I the only wish I had with this is that they really leaned more into kind of um some of the comic storylines and and the I really wish they'd had the opening scene where it's basically him puking into a toilet on the plane mm. instead of just opening with him diving out into the you know into the opening ceremony um but it is it's it's just big and flashy and Robert Downey Jr. just chewing scenery and then every scene that he's in with Sam Jackson you're like oh my gosh it's like a it's like an arm wrestling match of who's going to be able to own the scene not, not to mention Sam Rockwell busting out some of the dancing moves oh yeah so he did that like I guess for most scenes like that like pick up the pieces was his like hype up <laughs> music which fits so well with Justin <laughs> Hammer it's perfect um, oh not God. to mention like G- Gwyneth Paltrow probably has like her most substantial kind of mm-hmm. arc in this movie. Um, and then you add in Scarlett Johansson who mm-hmm. just is this like, I just, I really appreciate kind of seeing the, the beginnings of black widow mm-hmm. and the fact that even she, as this experienced agent, seems a little bit thrown by just the erraticness of Tony Stark. Yeah. Which I'm like, okay, this is kind of cool. Like, you put all that package together. And I just, I've watched this movie so many times. Mm-hmm. I enjoy this thoroughly, beginning to end. Um, so, yeah, definitely in my top 10. Um, I almost put it a little bit higher, but I didn't think it was merited. So. Yeah, I uh, didn't even make it into my top twenty. And my top ten, you know that's fine. I mean, you're wrong. I'm not wrong, but still, you're. I'm it, not wrong. It's okay. I'm not wrong. Okay. All right, my number eight goes to the original, the Avengers. At eight. At eight, you betcha. The lack of respect here, sir. Oh. It's no lack of respect. I I have some uh, movies that I felt were uh, of of higher import. Uh oh, I'm I'm making a note here for when I'm Call out. Call Roman Reigns. I'm making a note for when I'm out there to smack you right in the mouth. And good on you for dropping your phone. <laughs> it's old, anyways. It needs replacing. Oh God! Wow. Wow! What the OG Avengers like the that this has the this has all the stuff like all the things that, like you we and you number I, I I can't talk right now. <laughs> you okay? Go ahead. <laughs> so the reason, well, I it's it's hard to explain the reason why it came in at eight without getting into the other movies that are above it. But I will just say that I think for Marvel, they had very strong origin story outings. And this is, in a way, the origin story of the Avengers. It is something that is worthy to being in the top ten. But I just felt there were stories that were stronger and more uh, impactful um, that I felt were uh, of higher import. So 
It is at number eight. It is it is a good movie. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It's just a movie that I put at that ranking because I felt there were movies that um, had greater impact and uh, greater strength of story. <laughs> it's like I don't even know you anymore. <laughs> That's it. I need a podcast divorce. Uh, <sighs> all right. What's your number eight, sir? Uh, number eight for me is Spider-Man Homecoming. Okay. Uh, I mean, Michael Keaton, dude, mm-hmm. just so good in this. So good. And Tom Holland like plays like the awkward teenage Peter Parker so well, mm-hmm. so well. Um, I can even forgive some of the more, the cheesier moments. Like, you know, when he's, when he sees the Spider-Man mask half in the water as he's trapped under the concrete and that gives him the strength to go and like, okay, that could be cheesy. But yeah, at the same time, like Tom Holland has built up so much goodwill in that movie Mm -hmm. up to that point that you're like, whatever you do, you Tom, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you till the end. And, and even has like some surprisingly good moments of tension. Like, Michael Keaton and Tom Holland in the car after the after the daughter is like, hey, go to the prom. I got to have the talk with, mm. you know, and that whole car ride leading up to that. And. Oh, yeah, the whole thing was just so, so good, um, because I I kind of had I watched the first two Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. I never saw three. I just heard about the the uh, dancing scene, which is terrible because that James Brown song is one of the funkiest things ever on this planet. And it's kind of gotten a bad name because it was placed in that scene, which I can never forgive them for. Um, I never saw the Andrew Garfield movies. Uh. And so for me, like seeing this movie, I was like, Oh, this is what I always thought. Spider-Man Spider-Man should be like some like 20 year old kid. Like Mm Spider-Man is a teenager yeah, and he should be dorky and awkward, you know? And I always love that. And, you know, even going into like the you know the Staten Island Staten Island ferry scene, and then the afterward scene with uh, with Tony Stark and all that, like the whole thing to me was just so great, and everything I kind of wanted out of that. Um, so yeah, it, easy. Again, probably to your point about Avengers, even though I I think you're seriously off base on that one. Um, could have been higher, except I don't know who I'm gonna move in order to move homecoming up so but mm-hmm. anyways i got i managed to fit two spider-man movies in there so i feel pretty good about that what was your number 10 again uh spider-man no way home ah so okay. the multi spider-man flick and then your number 11 was doctor strange your number 12 was captain america winter soldier yes all right Just, I'm, I'm tracking because i want to i can i can like throw this all to you afterwards no that's all right i'm, I'm tracking right. okay what is your number seven sir uh, my number seven is Avengers and End- I'm kidding. <laughs> just wanted, wanted to see if Uncle Todd was going to like. Then I just know you're healing it up. Like, you're just <laughs> totally trolling me at that point. <laughs> you're going to be like, you know what? I think Thor the Dark World is number one. Uh, and Eternals is number two. That's right. That's right. Uh, number seven for me was actually Spider-Man No Way Home. Mm. And the reason I put it above, for example, a movie like Avengers is you know, when, when you consider what it delivered, which was something I don't think a lot of fans thought would ever be, which is Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield in the MCU. True. In yeah. a multiverse sort of story was really something that was different. And, mm-hmm. and I think the way they did it was done so very well. And yes, wove in the stories of the other two Spider-Men very well from, from the past movies um, that, that I thought it was, uh, do a, a higher ranking for that reason, um, as well as the fact that, you know, like you had already covered, you know, even though it ends in victory, um, there is, you know, the the very difficult sort of ending to it where he's essentially exiled from those he cares about um, mm. and by choice because he, he wants to protect them. Um, but I thought it was great bringing back all the old Spider-Man villains uh, from Doc Ock to, uh, to uh, Willem, or, or William, as I like to call him, because I want to get uh, under the ire of Uncle Todd. You're not getting uh, under my ire. You, one of these days, you're going to see Willem Dafoe like <laughs> staring through your window in the middle of the night. <laughs> You'll be like, it's Willem! <laughs> and you'll uh, never sleep again after that. <laughs> yeah, well, based on my track record of sleeping, I, I suppose I can't afford to do that. So No. Um, 
but no, just just it, it was uh, it was just a very very well done movie that could have gotten bogged down by all the different characters in it, mm-hmm. and it was the one of the few times I've seen a movie where they had so many villains and heroes and you know you had dr strange in there too it was there was just a lot going on and oh yeah it was it was very well i mean almost perfectly balanced um yeah. for for what they did so i put uh spider-man no way home at no and and of course like you mentioned Aunt may's death was huge oh yeah. um but but an interesting parallel to the prior movies um where you know, he, he loses someone close to him and then the other Spider-Men try to help him kind of reconcile that mm-hmm. I thought was really, really well done. So yeah. yeah, overall, um, my number seven pick Spider-Man, no way home. Right on. Uh, my, seven, sir. Uh, Captain Marvel. Really? Yeah. I, you All know, right. I think the reason I enjoyed this movie so much is because, uh, my daughter and my mm-hmm. wife both love this movie so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, it is. It's a it's a pretty damn good story, and I I think Brie Larson, uh, you know, in this movie, did a fantastic job as as Captain Marvel. There was I felt like there was some depth to the character. Um, I'm still a little peeved that they didn't cast Katie Sackoff. I think she would have made an excellent Captain Marvel. Um, mm-hmm. But hey, you know, eh, life goes on. Oh bloody, oh bloody. Um, but no, I just I, it, it was a fun flick and it was kind of interesting seeing a different a younger uh, uh more of a footloose and fancy free uh sam jackson uh as mm. uh, a, a d DA, is severely de-aged let's just put it that way mm-hmm. uh you know as nick fury um and again like the chemistry between brie larson and sam jackson was good you know and i think that goes a long way in some of these movies that you know like i like i said with uh you know scarlet and you know, Chris Evans, like it it just felt fun watching them work on screen together. Mm. So that kind of carried a lot of weight for me in this one. And Jude Law was, was, (laughs) was really good too. Yeah. And just smarmy and all that. And yes, that was fun. Nice. Uh, Captain Marvel is another movie that didn't even break my top 20, believe it or not. Really? Yeah. See, I can see your top 10, but top 20. Yeah. What do you got? Like Eternals at like fifteen or something? Like what, uh, I, who I'll do go you through, have in your top twenty? I will go through my others when we get through number one. Oh all right. my gosh! No, because I think it will hold. It'll make sense. I mean, th- these are not fluff movies that I put in there. It was a very difficult decision, and I oh, had to rate it accordingly. Okay. Unfortunately for Captain Marvel, I mean, that was I, I like the movie, but I don't know mm-hmm. that the or if I'm ranking origin stories, I got to say it was a little bit on the weaker side. You know what I mean? It wasn't as grounded or as connected or connective as some of the other ones have been, you know? And so I just, I, 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 that's, I call it like I see it. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Number six, uh, for me, Captain America, the first Avenger. Yeah, this was uh, that. I like that movie. And I got to say that's, it didn't make my list. Really? Yeah. Wow. That was a tough leave. That, that was, that was leave. one of the ones that was, I questions I'd would be in your trouble. top 20. Oh hell yeah! It would definitely it'd be like probably thirteen or fourteen easily. Mm. Um, solid flick, solid flick. I love. I, I just love so much about Tommy Lee Jones. Oh, oh my gosh! He's still he's still small or whatever. He's still skinny or whatever after he does the grenade. Thing. Yes. Yep. So good, so good. And and uh, and oh my gosh, what's the guy who um, who plays a scientist? Oh. Um... Isn't he the guy that has like a cooking show on CNN now? I can't think of his name. That's a random connect. I have no idea. No, no. Uh, Let me look it up. Oh, I'll look Cap- it up. You, you talk about your love for this uh, this one. I'll I'll look it up. For what? Oh, for Captain America, the first. Yeah, no. I I, I think it was a great. Um, it was a great origin story for uh, the Captain America for Steve Rogers and and how he becomes Captain America. I like how they. Um, you know, in a lot of ways where it takes place in the past, I thought they did a great job of capturing the spirit of that and, you know, him. And what was the name of, of his group? I forget. It was like... Um, the Howling Commandos. The Howling Command, And and I, I love... Uh, there was that one actor, I can't think of his name, but he had that kind of like... Stanley curl. Tucci. Stanley Tucci. He has a freaking cooking show on CNN. Or not a cooking show. He, he tours like Italy and talks about food and stuff like that. That is so random. Uh, I believe Neil McDonough. 
Timothy. Yes. Dumb, dumb, yeah. He, he had kind of the curly sort of mustache deal going on. Yep. And, and then, um, and then the, uh, what was the, Oh my gosh. What was the guy? Uh, Kenneth Choi, Jim Morita turns up as, uh, the principal in Spider-Man. Yep. yep. Which was an, oh, such a nice little nod. Absolutely. We have Peggy Carter and, and we, yep. we get introduced to the, the romance there between her and, and Steve. Toby Jones as, uh, as Zola, that, <laughs> who is just such a sniveling little snot. Yes. It's like Hugo Weaving as Red oh, Skull. Oh, gosh. Yes. So, so just like at, at the very beginning, oh, my goodness, like that opening scene of him just showing up. and the, Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, so it's good. And then one of the more kind of haunting end scenes where he wakes up and he thinks he's in the 40s still mm-hmm. after, you know, he ends up crashing. I think that was an end credit scene, wasn't it? I think it was. Mm. I don't think it was part of the movie. I think it was an end credit no. scene, but he wakes up and yeah. he thinks it's the 40s and he breaks out of wherever he's in and he runs out and it's Times Square. Yeah. I think circa. Today. Yeah, today, like, you know, late 2000s, early 2010s or whatever. And, uh, and, and that one haunting line at the end of, of, of the movie where he's like, uh, of course I can't think of it, but it has to do with the fact that he wanted, he was waiting for one last dance or something like that with Peggy. Yeah. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it is. It's a very bittersweet sort of like it. I mean, it's I, got I'd a lot say, of layers to it. Yeah. Like it, and it's only on reviewing that you kind of get those layers because at yeah. first you're like, oh my gosh, this is so weird. And then, and then after you watch it, like it really starts sinking in. And especially now if I've rewatched that after watching, like getting through the whole end game thing and all that. And, and you watch that and it's like, oh, what mm-hmm. a fracking gut punch. Like, yes, now I totally understand. Like, you know what, Steve, you earned it. Yeah. Yes. I already thought you earned it, but now you earned it with interest. But you know? the weight of him being frozen for 70 years, you know, yeah. like like they just they found a way to convey the weight of that very, very well. Like mm. for him, you know, I mean, obviously for the other characters, it doesn't impact them as much. But for yeah. him and what he's lost and what he's missed out on, mm-hmm. I think was was really, really well done. So yeah. that is my number six is uh, Captain America, the first Avenger. Right on. Uh, my number six is the OG Guardians of the Galaxy. Um Nice. Just thoroughly enjoy this. It's such a great movie and it was such a departure from every other Marvel movie mm-hmm. up until then. It was so kind of bizarre just seeing this movie in, 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 in uh, trying to put it in context with everything else mm-hmm. because it didn't fit. You know, especially like me, like you. Having not read any of the comics, mm. I wasn't familiar with these characters. I knew Star Lord, Gamora, Rocket. I didn't know any of these people. Mm-hmm. And, but just going along for the ride was so good. And it was so well cast. Like, yeah, I, I can't imagine who else you get for Drax. You know, I can't imagine who else you get for Star Lord. Like, it's one of those movies that I'm like, I don't know that there's a casting choice I would change. Yeah. Um, mm. Zoe Saldana amazing as as gamora and and nebula i mean who else you gonna get um oh my gosh i'm forgetting her name scottish terribly scottish um she was amy pond i don't know i'm completely blanking on her name right now and i feel horrible because oh karen gilliam yes uh gillian gillian sorry yeah um or no i think it's actually karen gillen I don't know if there's a Gillian. I love how you have all the names sorted out. Willem, not William. Gillen, not That's Gillian. That's the one. Karen Gillen, Gillen, Gillian has been my nemesis. Like, I've this is one I've gotten wrong so many times. And I, I'm a fan. That's what really, you know, grinds my gears is I'm a fan. And I cannot, in my brain, sort you know what this what grinds my out. gears. Exactly. <laughs> um, but no, that the, the, I, I don't know there's a casting choice I would change even down to like secondary characters like the collector Benicio del Toro mm. come on I need a weird guy Willem Dafoe isn't available get me Benicio yep. okay um it's it, it was just and it's fun it's fun while also still hitting all the marks of what you want in a drama while also still hitting all the marks you want in sci-fi while also hitting all the marks you want in a comic book book movie and you got Michael Rooker with a sentient arrow mm-hmm mm-hmm the hell else do you want? Nope. It's it's, a, it's such a great movie. Such Good a stuff. great movie. Good stuff. 
Unfortunately, it also led to, you know, James Gunn getting put in charge of the DCEU, which... Mm. Yeah, Jury's out on that so far. Uh, yeah, way out. Anyways, uh, what do you got for number five? Number five, Captain America Civil War. Mm. You're going to notice a pattern here with the, the middle rankings. Avengers 2.5. You know... <sighs> But of all the movies, what what a I mean, th- this one flipped everything on its head, though. I mean, uh-huh. it was it you know incorporated Black Panther. It brought in, um, you know, the whole. Uh, I'm trying to remember is is this the one where where um, the Hulkbuster armor is part of it, or is that a different movie? Oh, jeez. Um, I think it is. I think it is. Holy crap. So you got Hulkbuster in there and you Wait. got no. No, that's um No, that's uh I think that's oh my god. Is that Age of Ultron? It might have been. Let me let me look it up. I'll I'll look at your this is your movie. I'll look it up. All right. But uh you know, just just the the tension between the Avengers um it is Age of know, Ultron. Is it Age Okay, yeah. sorry. Because it leads to the whole Sokovia. Accord. Well, yeah. what gave me pause was Andy Serkis as I think something the Claw or something like that. Oh, uh, Ulysses this, Claw. Ulysses Claw. Yes. He's in this. Oh, he's um, so good. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean this 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 film is just. I mean, it's amazing. You have Spider Man in it, which which was you know kind of his. I think this was his his debut, or was this after Homecoming? I think this was after Homecoming. No, this was no, this was his debut. Was it? Yes. Yes, it was his debut. Yeah, because because all of a sudden we get that we get that flash to to Queens and everyone's like, "Ah!" I remember in the theater I was like, "Oh, it's on now." Yep. Um, but no, just just a lot of great you know storytelling going on. Um, you know you have, you know, um, and actually no, Ulysses Claw was Age of Ultron as well. Because that was the introduction. Age of Ultron as well. Really? Oh, okay. So then it, it's probably uh, Remo is what I'm thinking of because he's that, that's where he's pitting uh, Tony and and Steve against each other. Um, yeah, because that that's what ends up happening is someone gets murdered, but it's pinned on uh, the Winter Soldier, and then it turns out it's not him. It's yes. something that Zemo, I think his yeah. name is Oh Zemo. Zemo yeah. is what it is. Um, but. Uh, no, just just I think from top to bottom, it was just a well done movie. Um, Tony, in a lot of ways, is playing kind of a villain character because yeah. he's wanting, you know, to finally. I mean, there 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 was the, the way they did it was brilliant because what he was trying to do, you kind of understood, but it, and and in some ways, it was him maybe taking responsibility for some things, but but also at the same time, he was being very hypocritical in a way because a lot of this stuff happened because of him and he's now putting his fellow you know colleagues or other heroes in in a bind in a tight mm-hmm. spot because he all of a sudden has this this you know flash of 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 conscience where he wants to you know be held well, accountable he's, yeah and, he's trying to clean up his own sins right but yeah which, which which is yeah. and that was frustrating for me watching the movie is because you know, there's this is a great scene when he walks into to to, to the prison where you know Ant Man and Hawkeye and others are are being held, and Hawkeye's there. Oh, here comes the futurist. He sees all. He knows all. You know, I mean, he he's uh, and that was a great expression of that whole thing. Which did you know? That's actually a jab at Robert Downey Jr. because he had put out an album called The Futurist. Really, I did not. I notice. believe that was an ad lib. Interesting, and. As ad libs go, that's a deep I mean, cut, sir. Well done. Well that's done. pretty good, right there. That is. That that's is. like that's like Kevin Hart at the uh, Tom Brady roast. Like, okay, I got to give you that. Yeah, you got me on that one, but that was good. F you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> that that killed me more than anything else. Is him just getting up to the mic and saying some stuff and just looking. It was like F you, Tom. <laughs> did you did you see the the video I sent you of Nikki Glacier with all the the jokes that didn't make the cut? Yes, yes. Holy, dude, that was. Okay, that was rough without those. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, holy, it was. Ooh, she was buddy. like assassin level. <laughs> yeah, she was good. She was good. Oh my gosh, 
she got, I mean, it was so funny watching Kevin Hart's reaction when she did the whole thing when, when she's like, Tom, you lost 30 million to cryptocurrency. Even Gronk was like, me, no, this isn't real money. And like, yes. like Hart is up, like standing up, just dying laughing. I mean, he was so like just impressed. And then after he goes up to the dais and he's just like, you win. <laughs> it's just like, you win. <laughs> Pretty much. Oh my gosh. Um, but of course the key thing here is we end up finding out how tied together, you know, Captain America, Winter Soldier, and Tony yeah. are with Tony's parents and their passing. And mm-hmm. that's the thing that flips it all into now Steve versus Tony and really becomes the the major fracture with the Avengers at, yeah. at the end of this movie. And so I put this at number five because it is just a um it's it's just such a critical movie to progressing into where we end up, you know, in terms of, of Endgame and, and yeah. Infinity War. Because a lot of the reason they, they lose in Infinity War is because of the fracture that exists between Tony and Steve. They don't come together. They There's no cohesiveness with the group until they suffer a, a, a major loss. And so, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, so I, I thought this was this was just such a well-done movie. I, and, and that's what's interesting. I felt all the Captain America movies were extraordinarily strong from oh, a story perspective. there's a reason why the Russo brothers got Endgame and Infinity War. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I didn't realize. So they did all the Captain America movies. Yeah, I did not realize that. I, I didn't. That know was that. their calling card, and I mean, I mm. think that on the strength of, I mean, I think one was good. I think mm. it was Winter Soldier that really sold Marvel and like, okay, guess yeah. what? Uh, in Civil, we're going to do Captain America: Civil War, and then you guys are, we're handing you the keys for like the culmination of this saga, and totally the right move. Those oh guys, my gosh. they nailed it. Yeah, they they stuck the landing. I mean can't say any more other than that. Well, we'll, yeah. we'll say more later, but yeah, more than like what's your number five, sir. I've been pontificating about civil war quite a bit. Number five, uh, black Panther. Ah, good, good one. Good uh, one. Good I one. mean, a movie that just like kind of took over Chadwick Boseman was fantastic. Um, in terms of, again, an origin story. That's kind of not an origin story, like mm-hmm. very much in the, in the, felt like a Spider-Man homecoming sort of origin story. Like there's something that's happened and now we're kind of getting that middle area yeah, that can be kind of ambiguous and, and weird is playing out in front of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course the, the, you know, the, the inciting incident happens in, in civil war where you have Ch- uh, T'Chaka King T'Chaka taken out in this bombing. Mm. So, I mean, we kind of see, Black Panther, that's kind of the thing. It all happens there. So now you're getting like the part where he's the Black Panther, but yet he's in Black Panther, he really becomes Mm -hmm. that character, even though he already is, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Strong performances all around. Um, Yep. And and just takes you into, again, like much like Guardians of the Galaxy, takes you into this world where you're like, whoa, okay, this is very different. This isn't New York. This isn't like you know, some other spot, like this is something we haven't seen before mm-hmm. in, in comic book movies. And it was wonderful. It was fantastic. Um, and, and was so immersive, I thought. Um, and then also, but just the, the subtext of the sins of the father kind of coming back. And what does that mean when you have Killmonger and all these things? Cause it, in some ways it's like, the dude's got a point. <laughs> Yeah. Like, are y'all actually listening to him? Because he's got some points. Like, it's it's that uh, it, what was it? Uh, the um, if you remember the movie Crimson Tide, mm-hmm. Gene Hackman, Denzel Washington. Yep. Uh, fantastic freaking movie. Uh, but when they're giving the briefing, and it all centers around a a uh, a Russian pseudo civil war, and they talk about this guy, and he's like, uh, you know, he he's. Uh, the, the way they put it is like, you know, he's he's got a real weed up his ass and a legitimate gripe, which is a dangerous combination. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's Killmonger. Yep. Like, dude's got a serious bug up his butt and he has a legit grievance. Yeah. Which which I think Actually, was the genius of the story. Was several it, legit grievances. He, he wasn't a one dimensional villain. It wasn't no. like it was evil for the sake of evil. It was, to your point, he had a legitimate grievance and... Mm-hmm. He maybe the way he went about it wasn't maybe the right way, but again, you know, that's all perspective. And, and, 
you know, in the same way, you know, I've talked about with The Walking Dead, you know, the character of Negan, when he was introduced in the television show, um, introduced in a very brutal fashion. And as that, as that season went on, you know, a lot of fans were asking the question, but is he really a bad guy when you consider what the good guys did to him first? You know yeah. what I mean? Like they, they took out an entire outpost of his, his people, they killed them all. So is he unjustified for, you know, retaliating? I yeah. don't know. But same thing with Killmonger. You know, he he had a grievance. And and I think what was interesting was the way they framed it around, I think because I think this is a, a back and forth he has with T'Challa, which is, you have all this technology and you're, you're keeping it to yourself. Like, why well, aren't you no, trying to was, share this? You that know? was a, was that a back and forth with T'Challa or was that a back and forth? I thought it was T'Challa, but I could be wrong. With his mother when he first shows up. Could be. Could be. One of, I mean, either way. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, no, it, and, and it is, it, it raises those points. Um, and yeah, it, it, oh my gosh. Fantastic movie, beginning oh, to end, amazing. Ryan amazing. Coogler just again knocking it, it out of the park, out of the park. Uh, all right, what do you got at number four? Well, to finish out my trifecta, my my four, five, and six are all Captain America. This is Captain America: Winter Soldier. Um, okay, fair enough. I I went high with this one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Civil. It was kind of a toss up between this and Civil War. I felt Winter Soldier had. Uh, really a, a tremendously strong story. We already touched on it, you know, with the in, injection of technology um, as well as the story like you talked about with Steve and kind of humanizing him a little bit through Black Widow. And um, and what's the um, what's the bad guy from uh, Captain America, First Avenger, the the weasel you were talking about? No, Zola. Zola. Making, that's... making an appearance via like the monitors. That was hysterical. Like, you know, like they take like... out one of the screens and he pops up on another one. Right. And and he and he's talking with with the accent and everything. It was hysterical. It was just I mean, but but I, I, I thought it was just, you know, really well done movie. Um, you know, felt a lot of ways like a spy movie. Um, mm, yes. Which, you know, yes, they're, they're dealing with, you know, Black Widow is a spy. Steve is in some ways a soldier slash spy. But done in just a very different way and and yet fitting in with this this comic book universe, you know, really, really seamlessly. And so um, so, again, you, you know, my picks at four, five and six for Captain America was I just felt like those three movies were just very, very strong stories, had a lot of impact. That impact rippled through the the the, the overall arc that was being told across the first three phases. And so, uh, yeah, so I, I, I got to go with uh, Captain America, the Winter Soldier, number four. Right you, sir. Uh, Captain America Civil War. Nice. See, I, it was a toss up. I mean, it's got to be in that top five somewhere because those movies are just so damn strong, you know, and, and yeah. the stories are so damn strong. And it's it is the conflict and it and it's yeah. the. The the protagonism protagonist ism. Of, oh, hold on. Of you can do your dust here. the protagonism, if you will, yeah, if, if you will. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I feel, I'm sorry. I felt dusty in, in the room. That very much was good call. <laughs> very good call. I should have seen that. Um, but yeah, it, this idea of like it, Tony is not just he's not the white meat baby face in this. Like that's yeah. Steve. Yep. Um, and the the I'm I'm I I love the moments in these movies. As much as I love the fact of of uh, of taking things off the page and making them three dimensional instead of two dimensional, yep. I love the moments when you actually get something where you're like, "That's a panel in a comic book movie mm-hmm. in a, in a comic book," and when they're coming together and they have that initial clash at mm-hmm. the airport, it's the same as uh, in Age of Ultron when they all they all line up and mm-hmm. they're kind of all coming together, and you're like, "That's a panel." Like that, it reminds you of where it came from. Yeah. And I just love those little moments. Um, oh, just, we didn't I, talk about, um, what's his name? Uh, Iron Patriot or, or Warhammer uh, getting injured. War Machine. War, sorry, War, War, War Machine. Yeah. yeah with, with Rhodey suffering his injury. Yeah. And, I mean, there's, the stakes are there because up until then, everyone's pulling punches. Mm-hmm. You know, and and you could t- because otherwise there would seriously be people getting hurt. And then you well, have it gets real, and, and and it goes back. to, But I mean that 
in a lot of ways was again a consequence of Tony's decisions, right? Yes. Tony wants to fight this battle, and because mm-hmm. he did that, it led to them doing what they did, and then his friend ends up becoming a you know paralyzed, you yes. know, for it. So again, and and what infuriated me again in that movie was that that conversation between him and Black Widow shortly after that, where he's acting like it's not his fault, like. Mm-hmm. Robert Downey Jr. does a great job healing it up as Tony, which oh, yeah. which I never would have in a million years thought would have been the case because Tony has always been, you know, really the driving force of phases one through three as a but good at guy. At the same time, like he's he's more of a tweener, dude. He is much more of a stone cold Steve Austin. Like he he has heel tendencies, like the 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 ego, mm-hmm. the the you know he is the million dollar man. But he has more charm. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. he can, everybody's got a price. Like he buys a building because he's going to destroy it and all, like all of these things. And, but at the same time, you under, you can empathize with him because he, he's dealing with the fact that like, you know, his parents were killed. And, and, and in the meantime, you have Zemo just kind of pitting everyone against each other, which makes mm-hmm. him one of the most devious villains because like this dude don't have a superpower. He just knows how to like work people. I mean that that's the irony of Zemo, right? He doesn't have a, like, like you said, he has mm-hmm. no superpowers, but yet he's probably the one villain who is able to do the most damage to the Avengers. And again, he's a guy with a serious weed up his ass and a mm-hmm. legitimate gripe. Like you guys dropped a city on my family. That's going to make most anybody a little bit prickly. Yeah, yeah, a little bit Which, prickly. I thought was kind of a genius move by them in their storytelling, mm-hmm. them being Marvel, is starting to bring in the consequences. You know, like, yes. like we watch these cartoons and you see Havoc being wreaked and you never saw, like it, growing up, you, you know, with watching Transformers or G.I. Joe or anything like that, right? War battles going on, things are getting blown up. You never see the repercussions of that because, yes. again, it's supposed to be fun camp fiction. You don't want to well, dude, pollute look at it A-team, with. team back when we grew up, like live right. action. Yep. Thousands of machine gun rounds expended every episode. Yep. Nary anyone is hit. <laughs> like these are supposed to be special forces and they yep. can't hit the broad side of a barn. Yep. The uh, stormtroopers of the uh, US Army if you will. Yes. All right, what do you got at number 3, sir? Uh my number 3 uh is similar to your I think you had this as Oh, so what was your number 4? Uh, you said Captain uh, America Civil War. Captain America Civil War. I didn't uh, note it down. Uh, uh, why not? So your number five is my number three, Black Panther. Um, and uh, we've we've discussed this, uh, I think, a bit already. But um, I, I think this deserves it standing in the top three as one of the stronger uh, mm-hmm. uh, origin stories told, um, you know, especially compared to, you know, your Doctor Strange is your Captain Marvel, so on and so forth. I, I, I just thought Black Panther just had, j- just when I thought they couldn't find a way to tell an original origin story, they found a way to tell an original origin story with him. You know what I yeah. mean? Like it's not derivative of anything that came before it. It's really unique unto itself. It's dealing with, you know, the culture and, and you know, this this hidden city of this hidden nation within, you know, the, the, the confines of, of the globe, who I thought was really really interesting and and you know just how that fuels the the villain of it all mm. which like you said is not a one-dimensional villain it's a villain who has you know some some legitimate you know arguments for why he's doing what he's doing and so uh so yeah so i, I had to go with this one um this this was a surprise for me again had no background or any knowledge when it came to um you know this from uh, like I ne- you know never read the comics. Didn't know if this was going to be a great movie or not. But man, was I blown away when I saw it in the theater. I, I thought it was oh, yeah. such a great movie, such a great movie. So my, my only, number three, Black Panther. My only gripe with Black Panther is now it seems like every other movie is you know remind them who you are. Yeah, like oh god, can we find something else? Like that has been just so driven into the ground. Now. Yeah, <laughs> like it was yeah. cool then. It gets less cool every single time it's reused. Yeah, <sighs> your number three, sir. Uh, my number three is Marvel's The Avengers, which ah, I, you know, so now we get to the heart of why he was so taken aback by my number eight, dude. It is the it is the thing that we never thought would ever 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 really happen. Mm. Like nobody had ever really attempted to have a bunch of movies, or in this case, what it was like five movies. Mm-hmm. It's it's not like 
oh, we waited 30 movies and then we linked them all up. Like, but still, even like getting four or five movies, standalone movies to all interlink to a point where you're like, and then everyone teams up in one movie mm. and have it work and be good. Mm hmm. I I can't say I would have ever put money on that because Hollywood yeah. is dumb. And um but this movie had everything that you'd want. I mean, you had the major characters, everyone comes together, you've got the the ups and the downs of all of it and and it and it's tough to remember now because these movies have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, but just what for me at least that battle of New York was Mm -hmm. Like, this is what I've always wanted out of comic book movies. Like, yes, the Hulk is being the Hulk and Cap is doing this and Iron Man is doing this and like all the, the little snippy back and forth. And I'm I, I, I like this was everything I ever wanted. Like if they had just been like, all right, we're done making Marvel movies. I would be like, cool. <laughs> OK, I'll I'm, take it. I'm bummed. But damn, like that would have been incredible. Um, and just, yeah, everything about that. Like to me, I still th like the, even just thinking about it a little bit of, you know, the, a little bit of goosebumps thinking about that, that moment when all the Avengers are in the circle and they kind of pan around and you see oh, them yeah. all there. Yep. Yep. I mean, fracking amazing dude. And then of mm. course, you know, the, you know, you know, uh, what is it? A uh, caps like, you know, uh, Dr. Banner, <laughs> Uh, bless you. Uh, you. You know, don't you want to get angry? Oh, that's my secret cap. I'm always angry. <laughs> and you kind of get this moment. I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, there's so many of those moments in that movie. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, 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 that could not be in my number, my top three. Understood. What do you got for number two is the big Understood. question. Uh, my number two. This is a, a foundational part of the Marvel Universe. Eternal, uh, is huh? uh, Yeah, absolutely. So you uh, have Iron a hand Man. coming out? Iron Man. Oh, this is my number two as well. Yeah, I, I mean, w without Iron Man, I don't think we have all of this. Um, this, this was no. such a linchpin to this thing actually taking off and being what it became. And Robert Downey Jr., you know, I don't think anyone would say he was typecast because I think, if anything it feels like so much of who he is as a person has been imbued in, into Tony Stark, you know, in terms of, of the, the snarkiness and, and, and the, the attitude and, and just the, the persona that is Tony Stark. Just, mm. you know, I, I'm not saying that Robert is Tony, but there no. just seems to be a natural flow of his personality in this character. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just remember when I saw this movie, I was so geeked out by the technology part of it. Um, yep. they, they, they definitely did it for the gearheads and for the tech heads, um, who enjoy, you know, seeing, uh, you know, a lot of this movie was him just kind of putting the suits together, you know, and, and it, it was you well, know, showing like the, the, the like the false steps in the iteration. Yes. Yes. Like going over the cars like, oh, oh, we're still good. 100%. We're still good. <laughs> and, you know, you, you think that would bore the bejesus out of out of a movie audience, but everyone loved it. Oh, I mean, yeah. it just it made it such a cool movie. And so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, this, this was a no brainer as number two. You, you've, you know, if, if you don't have Iron Man, the only reason it's not number one is what I think we both have for number one, because I don't think, you know, I, I don't think Iron Man supersedes that. I think what, what we have for number one is truly probably the best outing for Marvel. Um, or Ragnarok. Totally. Absolutely. Well, I was going to say love and thunder or dark <laughs> world for that matter. Um, but I'm surprised. Uh, I actually, I, now that I think about it, I'm like, I'm, I, I, I don't know how I left Thor Ragnarok off of here. I probably should have gone with that instead it, of Captain Marvel. I put Ragnarok in my top 20, but yeah. I did not I couldn't justify putting it in my top 10. There's I just could. Too I much could make other an good argument. Stuff. I could I could definitely make an argument of sw of outright swapping Captain Marvel and and Ragnarok. Um, All right, that I could go with because and, of, it, and honestly, I I if I if I were to be able to rewind, I might do that. But anyways, uh, you know, Iron Man, fantastic. I mean, Jeff Bridges as Obadiah Stane, mm -hmm. Jensen. I mean, the introduction of Pepper Potts, of Happy Hogan. Just everything about the movie mm -hmm. was great. Yes. And, and the, what I love is, in a way, it's like the, it isn't necessarily the way that you would start a cinematic universe. 
Mm. Like if you were to sit down and plan it, is this how you would start? You know, but it was it was a I, and what I love is that the fact that it is kind of a compromised vision because you can't use Spider Man. Spider Man's sold off to Sony. You can't use the Fantastic Four mm-hmm. because the Fantastic Four is off with uh, uh, what was it, Fox. And you right. can't use the Incredible Hulk because Incredible Hulk is loaned out to Universal. Mm-hmm. Like your all of your top properties are somewhere else. Like the the first family of comics in the Fantastic Four and Spider Man, who's always uber popular, you know. And so you're like, all right, well, we're gonna start with Iron Man, this like arguably B level comic book character, and this is where you're gonna build it, and that only works. If you have Robert Downey Jr., I believe, mm-hmm. who at this point is acting his ass off because he couldn't get, they had to like argue and fight for him to be cast because this is after Robert Downey Jr. had just gone through a ton of public, very public uh, problems over mm. the years. Incredibly talented. Nobody, I don't think anybody didn't believe he was talented. They just were like, I don't know if this dude can stay clean long enough for the movie to get out right. and to actually promote the movie without becoming a PR disaster. Mm-hmm. They had to fight to cast him. You have John Favreau who directed this thing and, and uh, from different stories, either there was no script or the script was a loose interpretation and a guideline that they then improvised used as a basis for improvisation to the yeah. point of frustration to Jeff Bridges who was like going out of his mind for a few days, like, what the hell are we doing? Until he was like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, this is just a really expensive student film. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm good. That's and, funny. There, and there's so much out of this movie that is just so stinking good. Yeah. And just then informed how the rest of this whole thing was built. And then when you think about it, John Favreau kind of kick-started the MCU and his fingerprints are all over phase one. Mm-hmm. And he's also kind of the guy who's kick-starting the, the renaissance in Star Wars streaming and all this along with Dave Filoni. Man, we all ought to send a, a fruitcake to John Favreau mm-hmm. <laughs> every Christmas from now until eternity. Yeah. I mean, we owe this dude. We owe him a lot. Yeah, 100%. Um, but yeah, such a great flick. And I've, I've watched this movie without exaggeration 50 to 60 times yeah same here i mean it's just it's i, I might rewatch it. it after this after we finish recording on not me i'm going to bed i'm freaking exhausted <laughs> i thought we could put it on twitch uh, all right i gotta wrap this puppy up or i'm gonna go all right uh number one sir i think yes, is this so just as number two was the same for both of us with iron man number one i believe is the the duo, the pairing we've made of Avengers, Infinity War, and Endgame is, am I mistaken or am I not? This was a foregone conclusion. Yeah. This is why I was like, we got to just mash them together. We both know it's going to be number one, so let's just I mean, the absolute, and, and apologies if this is uh, offensive to anyone when I say this, but the absolute <laughs> balls of them to end Infinity War the way that they do. Oh, yeah. With the good guys, not, I mean- I thought the good guys got beat in Empire. Mm. This somehow they out empired Empire with, oh, no. with the ending of this. They just didn't get beat. They got their asses handed to them. Absolutely. <laughs> they got whooped and then some of them disappeared after being whooped. <laughs> so Well, and the fact is like it's not even like like some of them, half of them disappeared. Vision's dead. Yeah. Like just yep, flatline. Yep. Like, he yanked the little jewel out of his head and he turned gray and pfft, that's it. So it is there's like no hope for him. Yes. Oh like, yeah. This was what, total downer. You know when when we were talking about you know the failures of what they did with Kang. You know the the start of Infinity War with Thanos killing Loki, with Thanos beating the tar out of Hulk. Yes. Um. Jeez. To the point where Hulk doesn't want to come out anymore. Apparently. <laughs> Which I love Tony. He's like, well, you know, performance issues, one in five, you know. <laughs> I mean, once again, you just got to love the comedy. Got to love the comedy. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, this, just starting with Infinity War, the way that this plays out where you think they're going to, like, like, you know, there's another movie that's going to happen after this. Yes. But you're not thinking in your head, 
that they're going to lose at the scale and level that they do. And mm-hmm. when it starts to happen, like I literally in the theater, I'm thinking this isn't really ha- like, this is a movie. This is a fictional movie, but I'm thinking yeah. in my head, this can't be happening. They're not really going to do this. Yeah, no. And they did. Yes. <laughs> they took everyone <laughs> or at least half of everyone. And, um, and so, I mean, man, I, I can't remember other than empire strikes back walking out of a movie where you're like, Holy crap. That was, I mean, it was like a times gut 10. punch. It was a gut punch. Crazy. At least there was hope. Yeah. At the end of Empire. Like, yes. there is a little, there's a shred of hope. At the end of Infinity War, they don't give you any hope. They have, they have uh, uh, Nick Fury getting the beeper and he's like, yeah. and then he starts to say, Mother. Like, Mother. <laughs> that's your one bit of hope is you see the Captain Marvel <laughs> symbol. But even that, that's like a yeah. post credit scene. Yeah. Yeah, like the way this end Infinity War is like and scene. Yeah, I mean, and and that to me is the genius of it. It's just the the way the Russo brothers carried that out, <sighs> yeah. and then when they start Endgame, with it being five years later, and you see how, you know, Steve Rogers is hosting like a a, a counseling group for for people who have lost folks mm. because of like like they start playing which includes the, one of the Russo brothers in a cameo, which does yeah yeah. Which is great, um, but but the fact that they they really lean into the the impact of all of this and yeah. and they lean into the fact that these heroes are suffering. Like I know you know Thor in a lot of ways is kind of a a bit of a, a comedy gag during Endgame with you know his how he looks and the way he behaves and stuff. But he's a guy suffering from the fact that he was this close from stopping it mm-hmm. and he couldn't do it. Well, and the thing is, like, here's the thing. There's a so uh, okay to sidetrack just a little. I know you need to get to sleep. So the idea of letting someone off with a laugh, giving a little bit of a pressure release. Yeah. So like the the uh, the show that I I used to watch eons ago, Titus on yeah. Fox, yeah. and um, they would they would let you off with a laugh sometimes, but it would take a while. Mm-hmm. They would build that tension. Infinity War to Endgame does not let you off the hook, really. No. Until the very end. Mm-hmm. Not until on your left. Yep. That's a hell of a lot of tension to build, even though you kind of give people a little, you take a little bit off the pressure valve. Like, okay, going to yeah. see Thor, and we've got chubby Thor. Okay, psst, okay, there's a little little pressure that comes off. But then we go back into this. And, oh, by the way, you took off Thanos' head, but the gauntlet's fried, so you're screwed. Yeah. You know, it's like it, you just keep escalating. Mm-hmm. And it's it's like we said when we talked about this originally, like it transcends into good cinema. Mm-hmm. Like it's not just a good comic book movie anymore. It is actually good cinema. Like this, these two movies put together are wonderful storytelling. Yeah. It just happens to be about superheroes in the same way that Battlestar Galactica like is a is a very much a character driven drama that just happens to use sci fi mm-hmm. the genre as a setting. Yeah, I mean, we failed to mention, you know, we lose Gamora in Infinity War. Like she's yep. killed by Thanos, basically thrown off a cliff and yep. dead. Which again, you're you're like that can't really have happened. Yeah, they'll no, they'll be. bring her back. Yeah. No, they don't. They, well, they do, but it's not the same. It's it's not the same, right? And and you know, lest we forget as well. Prior to that, the conversation Gamora has with Thanos, where as as misguided and as you know, somewhat crazy, his ideas are again similar to Black Panther. He is a villain who has a I don't want to say a legitimate way of thinking, but but he's thinking about the universe in a way that you can kind of understand that there are finite mm-hmm. resources and we're gr- the population of all these different planets and galaxies are growing out of control. And I'm simply trying to do something to, you know, keep all of that stuff in check so that we can persist. Yeah. And yet at the same time, the madness behind it is, well, then you're basically saying you have to slaughter a bunch of people, right? Which in yeah. and of itself is not, something that you should need to do right so um what is it the uh so if you go back to dr strange love 
Mm-hmm. George C. Scott's character is like, you know, well, we're, uh, you know, I, I didn't say we're not going to get our hair. Our hair must. Uh, <laughs> casualties around 50, 60% stops. <laughs> yeah. 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 Basically. Basically. And you're like, and but, there's people who think like this. Awesome. But Thanos is just such a well defined and mm-hmm. well rounded character himself, you know, yes. that when you see him finally get his, his comeuppance at the end of Endgame, um, it's not like he's easily dispatched. I mean, it is no. it is a right to the wire sort of battle, and it's only through Rain again fire. the sacrifice of one. Right, right. It's only through the sacrifice of Tony, um, which in of it in, in and of itself makes sense because there's this underlying theme of him being able to rest. We saw it in Iron Man three. We saw it in uh, in in the original Iron Man as well that he is, uh, or, or sorry, in Age of Ultron. You know that he is driven and motivated by this idea that that he has to protect humanity that something big and awful is coming and now but, that it's arrived yeah but it also goes back to the first avengers when mm-hmm. cap is saying you're not the guy to lay down on the wire exactly yep and in this yep. one it's like he yep. does and yep. and it, in a way it, it yeah oh man and we lose black widow and that yes. was another one where you know, you didn't know if you were going to see Hawkeye or her go over mm-hmm. go over the cliff. You know, you thought it, it was really unclear how that was going to play out. And when it was her, you're kind of, th- I mean, either one of them dying would have thrown you. But Oh, yeah. But it was something about her being the one who, you know, forces her sacrifice, which was just, you know, you know, it, it was heartbreaking. Well, and and you so also, then you have all that, you have the entire Hawkeye thing. Yes. Beginning of fracking Endgame. Yep. Into Where the he's, Ronin thing, he's a killing machine. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, but, it, but then watching it, like his whole family dusts away. Yes, like, that was the beginning of part of the beginning of Endgame. Yep. And then how he becomes this killer, and then all like all, I mean, all the way up until like you know when <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but it's 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 insane. Just like how they're talking about like, well, can't we can't we bring her back? And he's like, you go talk to the guy with the red face. You go talk to him and ask him. <laughs> Right, right. Yes, and it's funny when you because it could be over, it could be overacting, it could be goofy yeah. and B movie, but the Renner man he plays that so passionately and straight, mm-hmm. like it's intense. It is. It oh is. my gosh! And then of yeah. course you have the whole Tony funeral scene, and, mm. and then everything with Cap at the end, which I mean, in in a way brings all the phases together because you have all the characters, oh, yeah. like like, and we've talked about this at length. This goes way back to early episodes, so. If you want to jump back to those those first couple episodes we did, we talked about this, but that like like I think what hit me in the gut a lot about seeing that wasn't so much you know them mourning a character more than it was as they were going through all of those characters. It was me thinking about mm-hmm. all of these movies I've watched with my kids as they've grown up, mm-hmm. and and now we're here. And when that came out was right around the time that our my, my oldest and I think it was my oldest, you know, was going to college. And so this was kind of like the end of his, you know, really his childhood, his teenhood, you know, Mm -hmm. was, was this. And so, um, it it was just done so well, top to bottom. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, we talked, we touched on Thor briefly, but the way they humanize these heroes, Mm -hmm. even though he's a God, the fact that he's struggling with this idea of, of not measuring up to what he could have been, Mm-hmm. You know, is something that we all, you know, I think at one point or another struggle with. So, I, again, the way they bring the human condition out in these heroes was just so well done. And that's a, that's at least during that period what Marvel was so good at was yeah. making these characters relatable to the struggles that we go through ourselves in our day to day or, or you know, through life is, you know, second guessing ourselves, the insecurities, the doubts that you know, even those who are imbued with gifts and, and who, who seemingly have it all don't have it all together. And mm. so I, I, uh, you know, one of the best scenes, you know, in, in end game is when they finally have the, the, uh, um, what's, what's the, the gauntlet put together and they're talking about who's going to wear it and snap the finger and Thor wants to do it. Cause again, yeah. he wants to, he's like, you know, what's running through my veins. And I think, it, I yeah. think Rody pipes up. He's like, cheese whiz. <laughs> And 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 Hemingsworth plays it so well. He's just like, <laughs> it's like you jerk, but you're right. <laughs> Pretty much. 
<laughs> but that yeah. and Tony's like, you know, there, there's more electricity flowing through this thing than is flowing through a continent. And you're like, you know, high on Jack Daniels right now. It's like, no, we can't have you touching that thing, buddy. Yeah, probably oh. not be a good idea. Oh, my gosh. But no, just I, I mean, those two movies were just mm. perfection, just yeah. absolute perfection. And I, you know, looking back to 2019, I mean, we almost didn't see it because of the pandemic. You know what I mean? Like we were that close to the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and how that would have impacted their ability to release that. But man, four times. What a what a what like like what a experience to go through with mm-hmm. the with the movie audience we were with. We saw it the opening weekend. Mm-hmm. And it was like you were at a sporting event. Oh when, yeah. When the on the left scene and oh. everything that happened from that point forward, it was like a freaking sporting event. Mm-hmm. It was crazy how people were just that losing end, it. That end fight is like a half hour, 40 minutes long. Yeah. Yeah. And there isn't a moment that I would change or trim no. or whatever. The women get together, the place goes freaking nuts again. <laughs> oh yeah. It's it was it was amazing. It was yeah. absolutely amazing. So yeah, yeah. I uh I, I I don't see how you can do any other movie above those two because they are just perfection. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, real quick, uh, because you asked, I'll give you uh, r- just real quick. So I mentioned my honorable mentions for eleven and twelve uh, for my top twenty. I uh, went yes. uh, Guardians because you're an Gal- overachiever. I am. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two was number thirteen. Avengers: Age of Ultron number fourteen. Iron Man Three number fifteen. Thor. 16, Thor Ragnarok, 17, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, 18, Ant-Man, 19. I thought I had 20 here. What happened? I am shocked that you have Iron Man 3 that high. I liked Iron Man 3. I thought it was a great... I What I liked about it was it took the technology away from Tony and kind of brought it back to him being kind of an inventor, you know? Yeah. And, and I know the Trevor Slattery twist is not something that fans like, but... In a lot I of ways, like that. I, I, I know. I, I think a drunk Ben Kingsley is phenomenal. It's just like, you know, hey, how are you? <laughs> it leads right into Shang-Chi where he's like, <laughs> you can see him too. <laughs> which, that's true. In Shang-Chi, they redeem him to some degree, which is well done. Well I would, done. I love that where, where he's like, I, I love how the fact he thinks that's a hallucination the entire time. Yes. Like, that's fantastic. Yes. Yeah, I thought I I don't remember what I don't seem to have a number twenty here, and I thought well, I, I I think I might have hit you up early, like in the middle of the afternoon, like hey, let's just make it ten. Yeah. So I probably caught you right in in list composition. Well, I did go Ant Man last because I did feel like that that was kind of like the the comedy Marvel movie, you know. Was, I, was, the original Ant Man I liked. It's the yeah. the other Ant Man and the Wasp, not bad. Yeah, not bad. Ant Man Quantum Mania. Ah. Awful. Let's just forget it ever happened. Awful. <sighs> but anyways. Well, we made it, sir. We made yes, it. We, we did, did our top 10, and now it is official. It is codified. So say we all. <laughs> Until, like, next year. Uh, what have you got for and another thing, a recommendation for our listeners, sir? Well, seeing as I'm the kiss of death for whatever I, re- I recommend given last week's recommendation. Well, at I least feel, this, this show is done produ- production, right? I feel pretty good okay. on this one. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, but I was surprised last week to find on Amazon Prime that because um, for a while it had been on Hulu and I don't uh, Hulu is one of the streaming services I don't have. Mm. Um, but uh, Schitt's Creek uh, is on Prime Video. So if you are a uh, paying member of Amazon mm. Prime, you get it for free. Um, but started watching it with uh, my wife and, uh, you know, after a long hiatus from having watched it we, we watch it actually all the way through and then we um about a month or two later did another all the way through viewing because it's it's such a great wow. series it is such a great series it is in a lot of ways it's like comfort viewing you know mm-hmm. it's just it's a it, it the comedy is is so well written um the characters are, are wonderful and and especially when you get into seasons three through six there's just such a great heartfelt stories being told um and and, and funny just so so funny um uh, so I, I would just highly recommend it. It is, uh, it is, yeah, it's just comedy at its finest and it is, uh, just a pleasure to watch. So I would, highly, if you're looking for something that will bring some levity and some joy and some peace and some laughter, Schitt's Creek is what it's about. Chris Elliott, he, he plays an idiot with the best of them. And, uh, <laughs> you want to talk about typecasting, <laughs> And his his character's name of Roland Shit. <laughs> I 
I just go back to Cabin Boy. Hey, uh, oh, hey you want to buy gosh. a monkey? Yes. But Eugene Levy, Catherine O'Hara, Dan Levy, um, and then uh, Ann Murphy uh, are just amazing. Uh, Emily Hampshire, uh, she plays uh, Dan Levy's character's best friend, Stevie. She's amazing. I mean, just the the chemistry. But, and I don't mean the romantic chemistry. I just mean the comedic chemistry between yeah. her and Dan Levy is just off the charts amazing. I mean, they're just such great such a great pairing together. It's almost like the next version of Eugene and Catherine is Dan and, and, and uh, this, this gal, Emily who plays Stevie. So uh, do check it out. If you can Schitt's Creek on Amazon prime, you know what else is on Amazon prime? What is that, sir? Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. Which has not been on a streaming service for quite some time. I don't know if they're going to have the, the craptastic sci-fi um, cut <laughs> versions that you were watching. Oh. God. They kind of wholesale cut out scenes that were. I in feel the like we have to do a total version. re-review of the whole series based on that editing. My God, oh, I'm. I, I actually. So I. I. I texted you like there. I. I think I might end up investing in because it seems like all the streaming services are getting a little out of hand now, and everything's combining, and everything's everyone's prices are going up. I'm starting to get a little bit, bit more back into physical media. Mm. I'm thinking it might be time to uh, up my game because I got the. I've got all of BSG on DVD when I originally bought them because I didn't have a Blu-ray player at the time. Yeah. I'm thinking it might be time to up- upgrade and to get the entire series on Blu-ray so that I have it high def mm-hmm. forever and ever. Amen. So whatever they decide to do with things, I'm covered. Uh, but which leads into my and another thing, which uh, I didn't mean to for this to be kind of a repeat, but it is. Uh, I'm going to recommend... The uh, the new episode of the Sackoff Show, nice. uh, with Katie Sackoff with Battlestar Galactica alum Trisha Helfer, Ooh. Caprica Six, and I I love the fact that these two are like sisters from another Mister in real life because I'm like, okay, yeah, this actually tracks really well for me. Like I could totally see you two hanging out. Um, and it, and drinking far too many margaritas and then just like devolving into giggling and crying and stuff. It's it's mm-hmm. it sounds like a fantastic thing. Um, it's a great episode because uh, they so Katie Sackoff I, I think is is a pretty good interviewer and she's getting better I think um, as an interviewer. Uh, this was in apparently this was uh, something that they had previously recorded, so it's kind of being like thrown forward into this season. Anyways, she did not ha- come up with any questions before this, and it was just sort of a very free-form conversation between the two of them, and she got into a lot of, like, Trisha Helfer's early life growing up and all that stuff, and it's – it was f- – one thing that stood out to me was mm-hmm. there was a point when, um, you know, Trisha's like, oh, well, they get to this point where, oh, well, you're not young enough, you're not pretty enough, and I'm like, in what effing world do people look at Trisha Helfer and go, eh, you're not pretty enough anymore? Like, yeah. Have you seen her? <laughs> like this woman is is kind of defying age mm-hmm. in many ways, um, but it, it's just it that just struck me as hilarious. Yeah. Um, the one thing that is interesting, sir, that does track into our show uh, about three quarters of the way through, they actually do address the Sam Esmail reboot. Ah, and Katie asks Trisha what her thoughts are on it, and and. Um, I guess they both kind of come down with the the opinion of, well, it's fair to do it because what they had done was a reboot. But however, they both feel that the 2004 Ron Moore version really has held a lot more sway in the in cultural zeitgeist terms mm. of still being watched, still being talked about, still being much more of a thing. And of course, by virtue of, of lasting for more than a season. The original 78 show was essentially like a movie that then turned into a series series. And then they well, it was trying to cash in on the star Wars craze at the time. Well, it right? was, but it, it, it was, it, I think it was a combination of like the, the viewership tailed off through yeah. the first season. Plus it was uber expensive to produce at the time. Um, they tried to do a second season, which was, did not work out well. Galactica eight nineteen eighty, and um, and their contention being like, well, between the miniseries and the four seasons of the Ron Moore show, it's st- it, it has it's a more robust story, mm. and and has held sway in, even though apparently like 
if they were to, which they're not, release the show now, it's essentially the same time period between the 78 show and when the the Ron Moore show aired, and then from Ron Moore to the Sam Esmail, if they were to release it today, which we know they're not. Um, but then there was the thing that I found interesting was mm-hmm. that Trisha had a little bit of a, a little bit of tea that she wasn't willing to spill because apparently she said, well, and Ron Moore has given his blessing to Sam Esmail to do the, to do his own version of the show. Cause I guess he was like, I'm, I'm not interested in revisiting. So why not somebody else do it? Mm. He had one condition though, mm-hmm. that he was like, I don't want you to address this. Hmm. And she was like, well, I'm not going to say on the show, but I'll tell you afterwards. Interesting. And in that moment, I'm like, help <laughs> How dare Damn you? Damn you. Uh, uh, but it was great. Um, but stuff. the entire episode is great. It goes into like her career as a model and then getting into, into um, uh, acting more and then just kind of where her life has been. And, and the fact that like, it's just so funny, like listening to her, like, she's like, yeah, I moved to Atlanta. I've got goats. Uh, I forget what they are. <laughs> Their names are like Larry and something, I think. Um, Curly not to be confused with, uh, you know, Larry, the dog and CM Punk's constant companion. That's right. Um, but a fantastic episode and, and well worth your time right around an hour. So much more, uh, you know, compact and, and well edited than our shows. I thought this was going to be a short one and well, uncle Todd heard me and well, you're it. the one who said, I know that you, you know, I, I said, this is going to be a short show. I know that you've been activated like some sort of Cylon sleeper agent, like, Bang! All right. But anyways, uh, now listen, we're going to wrap this up so Tim can get some sleep. Yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in, for watching, for listening. We do so much appreciate it. If you'd like to uh, listen to the audio-only version of this show, you can go to freerangeadc.com. You can find all of our episodes there. Download them one at a time if you want. You can also subscribe to the Podbean app. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts. Uh, we are on, uh, I almost said Google Podcasts, but that ain't a thing anymore. Uh, we're on Spotify, we're on Pandora, we're on uh, Amazon's podcast service, all kinds of different services. Just search for Free Range AC, you'll find us there. But you can also find us on the YouTubes. We have full video on our YouTube, so you can see the EDC for yourselves. And uh, and the shameless plugging that Tim does week after week for Fender. <laughs> That's right. He gets like he gets like a nickel each show. I do. He's very easy to please. Um, you can also send us uh, suggestions, thoughts, concerns. Uh, you can send all those to Tim at freerangeedc.com. You can find us on the social medias. We are at freerangeedc on Instagram, Facebook, on YouTube's. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I will finally turn this over to the to the least idiotic member of the dyad of EDC that runs this show, uh, and and that's that's you, Tim. Why, thank you. Yeah, uh, But not before I ask the second uh, most important question. The first, of course, being what is hip? The second being what in the high holy hell did we learn this episode? Uh, we've learned the following, my friend. Uh, uh, we have learned uh, when men they call Tim declares that an episode should be a quick one, he will be proven wrong in on. one form or another. We've also learned the man they call Tim is kiss of death. For any series that are actively uh, airing and in motion, uh, Shit's Creek is safe. But Constellation, I do apologize for uh, cursing you into a quick and, and uh, swift doom. You are worse than Hulk Hogan. Thank you, Shiki. Uh, we have learned uh, that you know some of these movies, like Back to the Future, uh, who are like works of art from from a cinema standpoint uh you don't know how close you were from seeing something very very silly in those movies Just so. <laughs> That's it. absolutely and uh yeah we uh the, the original darker ending of that movie would have been uh, very odd and it definitely would have put it in a different category of movie the love let me talk to you that it is uh, we have also learned uh, that here at Free Range ADC, we do not accept the fact that the DSG reboot is a prequel to the 1978 series. It is no, in its own no, universe. Please, no, no, do not no. pollute it by that festering turd of a series. <laughs> the ghost of Richard Hatch is going to wake you up in the middle. You know what? You're going to have Willem Dafoe and Richard Hatch looking at you and know. 
<laughs> Lauren Green just spun the in his look, grave. The look on your the look on your face when I said that. Well, the thing is, you're normally just like so very, very nice and everything, and there you're like, and you know what? Screw that in particular. <laughs> It had to be said, my friend. It had to be said. My God, did Dirk Benedict bite, bite you as a child or something? <laughs> like a all. rabid not, dog? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, we've also learned that, uh, you know, just prior to Kalen's Comedy Corner, there, there's some ninja action happening there, and she will vanquish uh, Dada at some point. We, we, we will see. We will see. Uh, Uncle it's Todd was almost caught. Panther. Yeah. <laughs> I'm agile. I'm quick. Uh <laughs> Well, all that being said, uh, we do thank you again for listening and for going on this uh, two-hour journey with us. Uh, but as we wrap up, uh, and we like to close things out here at the range, be safe, be healthy, be kind, and be good to one another. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. The range is closed. It's like I picked the wrong week to quit drinking. I beg your pardon. What did you say? Damn! <laughs> you are such a disappointing pair. I prayed so hard for you. <laughs> Get out. And don't come back until you've redeemed yourselves. So say we all. So say we all. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Now cue my music, please. <laughs> whoa, 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 player. <laughs> I don't know if I want to go Teddy Long or Godfather on here. <laughs> who, who do you think I'm? T- you're talking to here. Man, I'm just I'm catching Uncle Todd off off kilter here, off guard. He's 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 reeling, he's rolling. What's going on? Oh my gosh. This is my problem. Now I'm not gonna be able to go to sleep for another two hours because I'm all like amped up. It's like, yeah. Well, I'll get you something to sleep more. Oh, thank you. Raising the roof, baby. Raising the roof. Now get the hell out of here!